have all those papers to electronically fill out. Yes. Mm, I haven't had the chance to. I've been really busy with school. I was hoping to get some more done this weekend, but... Well, I'm still in high school, so I graduate June 9th. And after that, I hope it's being much free summer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's what you said when you talked to me before. Yes, I am. I hadn't even heard anything about that. Hello and welcome to RPG Research. I'm your host, Hawk Robinson. Today we're going to be doing uh, applied gaming with basic D&D from the Beckme set from 1983, Frank Metzer version. Uh, before we get to that, we've got a little bit of uh, housekeeping and mystery stuff to do. We'll get to that as soon as we can. We're also hoping more people are going to show up. So far we have uh, Aislinn, am I pronouncing that correctly? Oh, her connection just acted up. We still don't have a working remote keyboard. Dongle. Hello, can you hear me? Is one? Hello. Hello, hello. Try refreshing your browser. Sometimes when it acts up, you have to just refresh the browser. Anyway, Aislinn's joining us uh, remotely over Jitsi, and then Dan is go. And I'm hoping more people are up. We can do it with two people. In fact, we can do it with one people. <laughs> but uh, it's certainly better with you know, group is technically. <laughs> um, so, and you'll have to excuse me at some point here. I've got to eat one of the characters or something. I've a chance of breakfast. Back to back everything. So, but we will be covering the transition from basic D&D, which is what we've done a couple of sessions with to introduce people to what I argue is the single best introduction to role-playing gaming ever published. It's just so, as far as from a neuroscience perspective, a learning perspective, recreation therapy perspective, and just a general recreation perspective, for an introduction, not ongoing use. Ongoing use, these manuals are very problematic. But for an introductory game of somebody who's never played, has no mentors, no peers, wants to try out this role-playing game thing by themselves and then bring in friends by themselves, I have yet to find a better, and I'm, I'm hoping I'll find something better. We've been posting videos and trying to get more info on that, see if anybody else says better. People said the Chaosium one. And, uh, nope. It is a good introduction, but it still front-end loves the rules. It has great examples of character making. 
not playing the game by page three or four. These you are playing the game. Um, so there is now suppose there's a new basic D fifth edition coming soon, and supposedly it will walk you through the character generation else. That's still not the best way to do it. It's more important to get them playing the game and then learn character generation between or as they go than to learn character generation first and then play the game. It's from a, a science perspective. So it sounds like the fifth edition one is going to do the front end loading of the rules, which we keep telling people not. And then maybe as a good introduction, we don't know. As soon as it's available. Now, what's interesting, according to John Walker, it's going to come out at Target first and then to the general public like the Amazon stuff in September. August, September. That's weird. And I wonder if it's the Hasbro Gaming specifically. They've yeah. been kind of, Hasbro Gaming's been kind of doing more of their own thing separate from WotC, which makes me wonder if WotC is going to be on the mm. Ever since I saw the um, the intro set for uh, Stranger Things, that says Hasbro Gaming. It also says WotC, but it says Hasbro Gaming. Uh, Aislinn, are you doing any better there on your connection? Hello, hello? Try re I'm going to try refreshing your browser. I'm going to try kicking out see if that. Um, hopefully she is there. Um, so this is just designed for levels one to three. Assumes you've never been before and have nobody to mention. Beautiful job. Play. Player's Manual, you play three solo adventures. Character creation. Welcome back, Aislin. Yeah. Yeah, so. I was watching you on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> so, um, if your connection acts up, uh, sometimes you have to refresh the browser. Just so you know. Um, but, uh, so this is basically. Now, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Aislin? Yeah. Is there a preferred way you, you like it? No, you're saying it right. Okay. You can just call me Lynn if you prefer, though. Well, it's whatever you prefer. I, I'm happy to go with. As long as you're okay with that, I'm happy either. If you prefer Lynn, I'll use Lynn. If you prefer Aislin, I'll no, use I Aislin. No, I prefer Aislin. Great. Yeah. We will use Aislin then. I just want to make sure. Right, thank you. Because, like, the Japanese, yeah. Japanese version would be Aislin or, you know, something like that because AI is I. Mm hmm. Okay. No. Excellent. It's okay. Irish, so Excellent. Like you got it right. Yeah, my mother, my mother's Irish. Her her maiden name's Ivers. Her mother's name is Mar. Um, and then for my, <coughs> my dad jokes that I'm more more uh, Viking than Irish because Ivers came from Ivars a thousand years ago, where they hated Ireland in County Mayo, and then yeah. settled in a thousand years ago, so it became Irish. But um, but yeah. that's why I'm six seven. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I get my my dad who's Finnish, right? He's all Finnish, and so he's like, "No, you're more. We we invaded Ireland so many times. I'm like the Finns didn't invade that much. The Norwegians did. Not so much the Finns. You guys were all farmers. <laughs> don't don't give me that. But anyway, good knife fighters, not really good, uh, Vikings. So anyway, um, uh, so you have played the old 1983 Frank Metzger basic set. You said right. It was the first one I played as a child, but that was when I was eight years old. So. That's fine. That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. A little bit. Well, and, and that's the point, though, is it is very accessible. And yes, so is. we've been doing a couple of sessions on how I argue this is the best introductory to role-playing game. Just so yeah, well structured. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I, I haven't found anything better in the way it's structured to teach role-playing game. Now, but it yeah. breaks down on regular use. Like, if you want to... The referencing it and everything else gets problematic. It's not from that perspective. It's not good for long term, especially when you get into the other books. Now you got to flip through like nine books and everything between companion and masters and blah blah blah. So then you switch to rule cyclopedia, which is a, you know put everything from basic through masters together in one book, better organized. This is for people who've already been playing. This is not actually the best way to start. Never played before. Don't start with the rule cyclopedia. Um, the, yeah. the the basic D D is available as PDF from Drive Through RPG and others. You can go buy the PDFs. They're they're five dollars each, four ninety nine. They don't have print on demand, unfortunately. I really wish they'd get on the ball with that. But you can get the PDFs and learn very easily. 
I can't recommend a better introduction. Now, as I was telling uh, Dan, sounds like they're coming out with a new basic D&D intro for 5th edition box set in June. Available only at Target initially, and then a couple months later to the general public, which is unusual. Target. Yeah. That's a very different release cycle than they usually do. So they must have gotten some special licensing deal. Yeah. And we'll make sure we grab a copy of that, you know, there when we will evaluate how it compares to all the other intro sets. Now I have on the way, and it took some doing, the other intro sets that I didn't even really know that much. Even John didn't know. When Rule Cyclopedia came out, there was at the same time a box set that said the new easy to master D box set in ninety one. They came out at the same time. Never knew about that. John didn't know that. Ninety four, they had the new D D Adventures intro. Ninety nine, they had another new intro one. And uh and like one of them I can't even get because it's like seven hundred dollars. It's collector's item. Uh and then fourth edition had had their D D essentials, and that's what this new fifth edition is supposed to be D essentials. A little differently. The D&D 4th edition essentials, some people were afraid it was a D&D 4.5, and it kind of was. It was a lot of rules fixes and tweaks, mm -hmm. but it was backwards compatible on like 3.5 to 3.5 problems there. 3.5 was an overhaul. So it was more of like a mm -hmm. 4.25 or something. D&D yeah. essentials for 4th edition. Did you play through that? Did you get to experience that? Which one? The, Sorry, you just had a lot of things. Yeah, I know. 4th edition D&D essentials. I think so. Okay. I have played a lot of things. <laughs> well, you're in good company if you played a lot of role playing games. <laughs> yeah, I figured. Um, so we now what the way we're doing this is we're not doing the full adventures and all of that. We're doing snippets to expose you to each of these. One of the things is we're trying to evaluate so right now in our tier one offerings where we offer games to the community and in doing our research. Got a list of games that we've standardized on because you want to do research, you want to control as many variables as possible. And if you want to train people professionally and, and re have a repeatable quality of service in the community settings and in professional settings, standardized. It means you got to pick which game system you're going to offer, how they're going to be offered, etc. And so we have different tier levels. And so tier one, we have Dungeons Dragons 5th edition, Tech Me D, One Ring Role Playing Game, Adventures in Middle Earth. Uh, Doctor Who role playing game, uh, and No Thank You Evil, and then we're evaluating superhero games. Um, so, like between, right now, between Beck Me and DD, DD 5th edition, very, very popular, right? It's the hot, popular game. Yeah. But it's, it's, even though they really simplify the rules from 3rd and 4th edition and such, it's still not really the best introduction I think to role playing game. And because of the increasing, um, Moral relativism, in fact, just general relativism that culture in the decades, um, you see that to avoid making any decisions, uh, the consequences to actions have been taken out of the game. There's mechanical consequences, but there's no, there's nothing to really reinforce heroic play. If you have a story, and for regular populations, that's not a problem, not a problem at all. But we work with a lot of at-risk populations. Incarcerated population, and they need clearly defined parameters of how to. They don't have that, right? Their their moral compass, everything else is all over the place. They come from abusive environments, all these and neglect, everything else. They don't get this guide guidance, and they they crave it, they desperately want it. They just want to know how they're supposed to get along in society so they can function. And you know, we're running these programs at alternative schools and such, and it's going really well. But one of the things we look for is behavior modification built into the role-playing game to encourage heroic play, as opposed to just, yeah, you can play out any way you want. Fortunately, with 5th edition, there's nothing really built into the rules anymore. Taking it all out, there's no real consequences to alignment. There's some class alignment, but even that, like Paladin's having so much flexibility now. And again, for regular populations, this is not a problem. This is this is just a problem for at risk and, and special needs and such. Great to experiment. You can play evil characters, all that, and research shows there's lots of benefits to that for just exploring through life. Role playing is a great way to do it. But when we have to work with so tier one is meant to be the more most accessible games that can be used with the widest audience possible. 
So probably the widest one is no thank you. Yeah. Right? It starts ages five on up. So it's the number one of our tier one offerings. And everybody yeah. can play it. Then what's the next one? I it's not D D fifth edition. It's still tier one, because it it is very flexible and accessible, etc. But I'm really leaning towards us switching our introductory sessions at all of our settings from fifth edition to Vecna. But I don't want to do this unilaterally. Right? I've I've been doing this for so long and I've just I just kinda of like, well, I've been doing it and here's my gut, and it was just me. But as we've grown as a community, I really want to I value everybody else's input and don't want to make these decisions yet. I'm president and chair, I can if I want, just go, this is the way it is. But yeah. that's not how I like to do things. I like to work cooperatively. Consensus building itself. Zero corollary of Dungeon Master. You know, rule zero, Dungeon Master is always right. Corollary. Don't have a don't have a group and you can't play the game. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you gotta learn to get along. Yeah. So um and I'm not a hundred percent because Beckme has some shortcomings with its mechanics, right? D and fifth edition mechanics are pretty good. They're certainly more streamlined than the Beckme style. Mm -hmm. Um so so I, I I haven't been able to pull the trigger on this. And so I figured the best way is let everybody most of you have not played it. Now Aislin played a little bit. Um you had not previously played this. No. Most of the group had not previously played it. Don had a little bit. I played this all the way through back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. All the way through Immortals. Uh, and really enjoyed it. Wow. I also did first edition and all the others, too. I, I was running three groups a weekend, two on Saturdays, one on Sundays, and I was paid mm -hmm. um, from 83 onward as a paid group. So I got to experience how awesome it was and how it really walked you through nicely. So what I wanted to do is everybody's going to get a, snippets of each there's the different levels that you go through. Mm -hmm. So we did the introductory adventure that's built into the Dungeon Master's Guide of the rulebook. Mm -hmm. Now we didn't get very far. You guys kept dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we went far <laughs> enough. Now it, the introductory adventure, I don't know if you played at Aislinn, is you leave your town and you go to this little castle and there's a carrion crawler there and then there's some kobolds who you know try to keep yeah. you out and then there's the keep and then you do your dungeon crawl. Do you remember that at all? Uh, no, I okay. don't think that I ever played whatever was in the book. Okay, and that's fine. Um, but it is it is a very good intro because it walks the DM through GMing for the very first time. It, what yeah. is the captions to read everything? It's the best intro. So now we're so we did that. We played a couple of sessions. We're like, okay, you guys got the point. You got a feel for this, uh, how the basic rules work and, and character uh, and. Uh, so now we're going to pretend that you did the rest of the dungeon crawl. <laughs> we're going to fast forward. We're going to hurry and level up your characters. In your case, Aislinn will whip up a new character. One of the advantages of Beckme, mm -hmm. so this is what's very different about 5th edition, that I think is so important uh, versus Beckme. It, it, it's problematic that it's really hard to die in 5th edition compared to Beckme. Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is when you want to do behavior modification, any level, teaching pigeons, teaching children, teaching adults, teaching senior adults, teaching special needs, whatever. The mm -hmm. closer you compare a effect, you know, causality, uh, an action, reaction, mm -hmm. the closer you pair that, so Pavlov's dog, the closer you pair the, the bell dinging and the meat response to salivate, etc., mm -hmm. the more strong the learning will be and the easier it is to learn. The, the more it's spread yeah. out, it gets harder and harder to make a correlation between stimulus and response. Yeah. And that's a very <laughs> simplistic view, but it does apply at a more complex scale. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you want people to learn to not try to use combat as their solution all the time, <laughs> having a game system that's really hard to die is not going to help discourage that behavior. Mm -hmm. With yeah. Beck Me, you hit zero hit points, you're dead. Unless you house rule like... So when we do AD and D and other things, we love to house rule because we feel it's a little too deadly. So we would say you go to the neg you know, negative ten was one option from Dragon Magazine, or the negative of yeah. your constitution. Mm -hmm. And so like if you had an eighteen constitution, you go to negative eighteen, and then negative nineteen, you're dead. And that for an ongoing yeah. campaign, that works fine. And and if they're non special needs, that works fine. Yeah. But for people that you want to just quickly introduce and have consequences. 
good news is, yeah, your character dies easily. We 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 ran that adventure like two or three sessions, and one one player only had one hit point mm -hmm. and survived until the end, right? Until yeah. the last session, made it with one hit point. Played very carefully. Wow. And they only had one hit point. That's the beauty. Yeah. The other thing that we do, and you need to know this, Aislinn, we roll the stats as they fall. So it's okay. 3, 3d6 rolled in order. That's how you were born. Now you got to make the best of what you have. All right. Now, if everything's below nine, okay. And it even says in the rules, if everything's below nine, re roll. But as yeah. long as as long as you have at least one halfway decent stat, like a twelve or thirteen, and everything yep. else, you know, and only one or two or you know, so so below nine or three below nine, you're supposed to still play the character. And you don't get to you only get to pick what you qualify for, right? You gotta have a minimum of a nine stat to play whatever class you wanna play. In that prime stat, right? If it's fighter, it's strength, it's, it's Yeah. Sticks in. So you 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 have to play with the cards you're dealt. Now this is very Pretty very much. different from fifth edition, where you can make anything you want. Now generally when we're introducing people, it doesn't matter because they're doing pre gen. Yeah. And but the nice thing because it takes so long to make a fifth edition character. Again, much better than third and fourth edition. Nothing compared to role master. But <laughs> but it does take a while to fully make a fifth edition character properly. Yeah. Yeah. Be, it takes 15 minutes to roll up your character and then another 15 minutes just picking equipment to the first time you do it. After your character dies, it typically takes 15 minutes total for somebody to make a second character. And yeah. they typically start to play very differently after their character dies the first time. Mm -hmm. they go, oh, my character died. I don't get a new life. I don't get a res. Oh, I, I better play a little differently. And what do you know? They learn very quickly. Uh, it is a very different style of play. It changes how people play. Uh, yeah. One of the complaints with people, a lot of DMs have is too many murder hobos. People want to change the terminology. Or <laughs> enthusiast, whatever. But Homicide punishers. <laughs> crazy killers, whatever. I don't know. Um, but the problem is 5th edition doesn't really discourage that. Yeah. Right? But which kind of sucks. <laughs> well, it's it's problematic. So you got to enforce it through the story, which again, with regular populations isn't a problem. But if you always have to six stormtroopers, I'm going to mix Star Wars here. There's nothing in Star mm -hmm. Wars to force you to play light side or dark side. Yeah. Some people choose dark side because they like the cool force features of dark side. And there's mm -hmm. only story consequences. And again, general population, that's fine. But for special needs populations, they don't know where those boundaries are. So... Back me still, even though it doesn't have as detailed an alignment system as advanced edition, advanced edition had nine different alignments: lawful good, lawful good, good, etc., etc. Basic only has three alignments: lawful, chaotic, and neutral. Lawful yeah. is basically meant to be good. Chaotic was basically meant to be evil. But then they also say chaotic doesn't mean you're evil. It doesn't have to be evil. Generally, most evil creatures are chaotic in their basic version. And then in later editions, they came out with, um, I think, seven versions instead of nine. Right? They didn't have, like, lawful neutral. But they mixed law and good, law and evil, chaotic and evil. Later, they, they, did, they didn't go the full nine, but they went to the seven alignments. But changing alignment, both in basic D&D &D and advanced D&D, &D, has dire consequences. If you do not play your alignment, you end up having an alignment shift, you lose an entire level. And if you're playing a Oof. class like a paladin, you lose all your paladin hood abilities. Yeah. You become a regular fighter. If you're a cleric, you will very likely anger your god and lose all your spells and have to start over. Mm -hmm. um, there are real consequences to playing against your alignment in older edition. They got rid of that from pretty much third edition onward. And the problem is if it's story enforcement, people who are at risk youth get tired of being told no, 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 no by the people they're interacting with. Mm -hmm. If it's in the rules, mm -hmm. they are happy to play by those rules. They really are. There's a stereotype. They don't want to play by any of the rules. Like, like, no, a lot of them, they just don't understand it. And they get tired of being told no, 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 and they don't understand why. And so then it creates a rebellion and blah, blah, blah all that mm -hmm. happens. But if they understand the rules yeah. of the game, which they don't like, they're usually happy to play it that way. So rules as written yeah. 
Beckme has far better behavior modification than. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So look at it from this perspective that we're kind of, we're evaluating this to see if our introductory game instead of 5th edition should be Beckme. Now, but we've, we've looked at the beginning part, and as I said, the introductory part's excellent. Now, how does it do as far as growth over time? Let's take a look at that. So that's what we're doing today uh, in my long-winded way of getting there. Um, we are going to do the transition from basic to expert. So basic is levels 1 to 3, expert is levels 4 to 14. And I was going to do it with Night's Dark Terror because the British modules are really high quality. And this is a really good quality module. Um, but with my limited availability for preparation, everything I'm juggling, this is more prep than I'm ready for. And it's a lot of political stuff, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But for just trying to give you a quick example, this might take too long to get. This has awesome maps and tapestry clues and counters. And it's a, it's a, it, it, it is an interesting example. E10. Yeah. It's, and it's a special basic to expert transition model, module for level two to four. Specifically designed for that. And it, it is, of course, in the Dean, the basic DD setting, Grand Duchy of Karamakos, which I have to here too. Which all of the rules go into with the expert onward where they focus setting. However, the default that came with the expert set, which maybe makes more sense to do, is the classic X1. Isle of Dread. You see the dinosaur? Woohoo! Dinosaurs! <laughs> um, so I think we're going to jump into this. Now, I, I have not run this in years and years and years. And because I made a last minute decision to change, I'm going to be prepping on the fly. That's part of the point of what we're evaluating. We're evaluating how much time and energy and effort does it take to throw together an adventure with these different versions because we want it to be the quickest possible play we want people to get playing as quickly as possible so that is what we're going to go with today so we'll read a few things we give you a little bit of flavor then we're going to go ahead uh Hazel will whip up your character and then daniel upgrade okay. yours and then we'll start jumping into the adventure now we only get so far in the actual play this session we will continue it again the next applied which is actually tomorrow Right, because we do Sunday, then Monday. Mm -hmm. Hope we have more people joining us then. Exposure. Uh, if we don't, then we'll, we'll we'll kick it. We'll play this at least two sessions. That's yeah. generally what I'm doing. Is each phase we do two to three sessions so that as many people as possible get a little bit later. After we're done doing two or three sessions of that, we will then go to the companion rules. Right, and that's uh, fifteen to twenty-five. Yeah, 15 to 25. Mm -hmm. And then we will go to the master rules, which is 25, 35 levels, mm -hmm. 25 to 35. And then this is the stuff I really want you guys to experience. Awesome. The immortals level, 36 on up. You petition a deity to become a deity. So you have to go on a very wicked adventure. 36 level on up. This is a whole other way of... Now, like superhero stuff, this is more in that line. Because uh -huh. you're going to demigod. And literally, like, the intro module shows your characters just walking through lava. It's <laughs> awesome. I think I'll show you that. And that's what I want you guys all to experience. Because none of the other versions really take you to that high a level. Even when they published the rule cyclopedia, they dropped immortals. They they uh, they just didn't go with the They then because and reissued immortals with Wrath of Wrath of the Immortals. Mm -hmm. So they, they added it on spots. But check this out. This is the, the Immortals one an adventure for immortal level character. Immortal Storm. And see there, walking through lava, like in loincloths. Pretty cool. So go ahead and show her on the. the... So that's. What I don't I'm have my video right. on. <laughs> what's, what's that? I don't have my video on or anything, so I can't see anything oh, you show me. I don't anything. think. Okay. All right. Well, mind. 
Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. I, I just saw it on your YouTube. There okay, we go. Good. As long as you see it on YouTube, that's fine. Yeah. That, that, that's just... Yeah. Uh, that's that, just red fire water? Oh, no, no, no. That, that's that's <laughs> chili. Chili. <laughs> they're, they're waiting through the shit. <laughs> So apparently she can. She's watching delayed on YouTube, so oh, okay. that, that's fine. All right. Yeah, I check in every couple of times when I think I need to see something. Okay, good, good. All right. Mind you, it's very hot chili. Muy <laughs> caliente. <laughs> but obviously, it's 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 you know it's truly divine chili because everyone's there. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> first of all, Aislinn, do you have a character sheet? Uh, no, not in front of me, but I can write one out super easily. Yes, you can. So get a, I, get a piece of yeah, paper and a pencil. paper, pencil, All everything right. in front of me. Excellent. And we're going to trust, we're gonna trust you with the dice rolls. We don't use roll 20 or any of that. And if you had a webcam, okay. we'd, have you, we'd just watch you roll the dice. Um, but it's... I'm on my phone, so I think I can turn it on. Oh, well, okay, hang on. Uh, make sure you are on audio only mode right here on your phone. And... Are you where you can use Wi-Fi instead of your cellular service? Yes. Are you using the Wi-Fi? No, but I can use it easily. Switch over because Jitsi will suck up a lot of your data. Okay. Yeah, I just switched over. Oh, well, that was that was smooth. <laughs> you didn't even yeah, I'm just sitting in my house. I just <laughs> okay. hadn't chosen Wi-Fi. Yeah, use always use the Wi-Fi when you're streaming. Now, if you want, you can use the video if you want. Okay, Point. give so, me a second, great. and I'll switch over. Great. Um, we can get these out the way. <laughs> okay. Welcome, welcome. Hello. Hello. Nice to see your, your human self. Okay, so go ahead and hold it in a way that we can see yes, the Yes, it rolls. is nice to see your human self. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so hold it so we can see the dice Let rolls. me see if you can see this. Let me switch my, I don't think I can switch my camera around. Okay. So here, I will hold it awkwardly. Yeah, sorry. And I can roll on, just straight on this piece of paper. Whatever works for you. But you're going to write them yeah. down in order. Okay. I need three D6. Yeah, and I'll just roll, I have one D6 that I will okay. roll three, three times. That's a three, two, three. Okay. Did you see that? Yeah, I saw it, yep. So just, just write okay, them down as you go. So this is how we do it without using Roll20 or any of these other things, it's software. Experience has been, <clears throat> as great as our products are, they they tend to interfere the long run with immersion levels. Six, nice. Another six. Nice. And a two. All right, good. Just write it down. Fourteen, right? Correct. She already has a higher stat than me. All right. That isn't difficult. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah, that's down. true. I'm going to wolf down some food. Sorry, everybody. Else. That's a three, a four, and a six. Thirteen. A one. That failed. A two. And another one. All right. That was an... Write it down. Ooh. Write it down. A four dexterity. That's real exciting for me. Mm -hmm. A six, three, and another six. Oh, wow. I guess all my points are in constitution. I must be a dwarf. <laughs> four, four, and another four. All right. So that makes strength eight and Intelligence 14, Wisdom 13, Dexterity 4, Constitution 15, and Crystal 12. Okay, and then you're going to roll... That's on about right? Yeah, and you're going to roll one additional stat. You're going to roll Comeliness, which is <laughs> appearance separate from Charisma. This is a house rule. Okay, I'm writing that down. Okay. I only have a vague idea of how to spell that, so it's probably spelled wrong. That's a 6... Six and a one. Okay. Uh, CMS is the abbreviation. Thirteen. Right. CMS? CMS. Okay, that helps a lot. Abbreviating. So I bring that from uh, Unearthed Arcana Advanced Dungeon, but I put it in every role playing game because appearance and color, yeah. the charisma and appearance are two different things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
right. It doesn't have a huge impact on like the game mechanics, but it has a great impact on the story. Just because of people's reactions. Mm -hmm. right, so now you have your basic stats. Now, uh, what yeah. class are you going to play? I usually play a fighter, but my stats aren't really good for a fighter this <laughs> time around. Because so, oh, my strength yeah, is only well, an eight. To, to have the so your choices are cleric, fighter, magic user, thief, dwarf, elf, or halfling. Okay. Is halfling a class? Yes, in, in basic D and D, dwarf, elf, and halfling are are classes. They're demi human classes. Huh. Strange. Yeah, that's that's how the base the Beckham um, The elf is kind of a yeah. fighter, magic user ish. The halfling is kind of a thief. Dwarf is basically a fighter, but slightly. Yeah, I'll do a halfling. We'll see how that works out. Now, only thing with that is you said dexterity is your lowest stat, right? Dex. Oh shit! Sorry, oh, 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 you're right. Careful, careful. Shoot, we you're right. Family friendly here. So. <laughs> yes, yes, I remember that as I said it. Yes. Okay. You'll get you'll get used to it. Unfortunately, I don't have any way to bleep it. Yeah. <laughs> We're sorry. All right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. So. Hmm. Um. Yeah, so prime requisite. Okay, so thief is certainly dex. Let's see. Dwarf, the prime requisite is. Might be con. No, it's strength for dwarf. So, so prime rec. Oh, roster. Prime requisite means you gotta have a nine or higher, otherwise, it's. Uh, elf, prime requisite. Oh, it means. Turn off your Azon, turn off your video. Just go ahead and go without video now. Go ahead and go without video because you're you're having too many problems. All we need is to see those initial rolls. We'll press down the rest. Oh, strength and dexterity. Yeah, you're going without video now? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So the the prime requisites for thief are dex, fighter is strength, your dwarf is um, strength, for elf it's strength and intelligence, for halfling it is uh, strength and dexterity, and a uh, cleric I think. Yeah, let's try out a cleric. Magic I haven't played one in a long time, but that seems to be best. Magic user's intelligence and cleric. Yeah, stick with cleric. wisdom and so what's your wisdom 13 okay if your wisdom is 13 or more you gain uh, bonus experience points for adventure and what is your awesome. highest stat constitution yeah 15 a constitution okay. uh, down the road so in expert version the, the stat bonuses are pretty limited when you get mm -hmm. to the companion and master's level they start bringing in Stats have more saving. It's kind of limited. Yeah. Early. All right, so you're going with Cleric. So that is a six-sided hit die. So roll a d6. We'll trust you on it. Five. All right, so you got five hit points for first level. Now we're going to assume, let's see, 5,000 XP. So for this adventure, I think let me know, I'm switching adventures so let's see what it says. The other one said everybody starts at five XP. Which 
should be between third and sixth level. Okay. So for your class, go with whatever is the minimum to have. So Dan, what class were you? Magic user. Magic user. Level. Pick your fourth level first. So, so let's go fourth level for both of you. Okay. Uh, you have ten thousand experience. You're a cleric, so fourth level. You're a vicar, six thousand experience. Title, by the way. No magician. You fifth level, you can be ten. Hi, bud. <laughs> Some call me Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so uh, fourth level cleric, 6,000 XP. Title is Vicar. But the different levels have different titles. Something I like from the, a lot of the new games. The first level is Acolyte. Yeah. Second level is Adept. Third. All right. Do you okay. do you have access to any of these rules, Aislinn? Mm, maybe. Legal Probably. access. <laughs> not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I'll have probably to be, not. <laughs> so I'll, I'll I'll probably have uh, you and Dan kind of share. Got multiple copies of this. Mm-hmm. Um, what I gotta do is I I've got to eat. My blood sugar is getting really low. Once we get you yeah. guys making your characters here, I'll let you two kind of handle that while prepping for the adventure. <laughs> okay. Uh, but before we do it, I want to set the tone of your expectations. Now, Dan, you need to uh, roll your additional hit dice because you're still first level, right? Yeah. All right. So what? You're a magic user. Magic user. So four sided die. Some of my fancy metal ones. Okay. Thanks to um, Dots RPG. It's high quality from Die Hard Dice. These are my. We will test how hard it is. Do not step on the four sided. It hurts. I think it was our new gun yeah. metal yellow <laughs> ones. Three. Okay. So that's second level. Yep. Two. Okay. Third level. Fourth level. Fourth. Four. You're doing okay. Yep. All right. So add that to your existing base hit points. That's your total. Okay. Are you sure you didn't level up? I think I may have. All right. But so I think that was the third level. Third. Yeah. All right. So then just add, add the last roll then. Right now, when you level up, <laughs> too important. Yeah. All right. So, Aislin, you want to go ahead and roll your d6 three more times? Your hit points. Yeah. Okay. Uh, five, three, three. Okay. Add that. You to said, your, said roll d six. Yep. Add that to your existing. You have sixteen. That's right. Yes. Okay. All right. Um. So you get, uh, with your wisdom being 13, you get a plus 5% bonus to all experience points. So when I tell you your experience points, so if I give you 100 experience points uh, during a break, you actually will have 105. Make sense? All right. Is that because of your prime requisite being yep. higher? Uh, Dan, what is your prime rec? Intelligence? 10, yeah. Okay, you have a 10, so you don't get a, so there's no penalty. Like, if it's below nine, you actually have penalties to experience. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
like having a low stat isn't a bad enough for your prime rec isn't bad enough as it is <laughs> all right um so cleric uh you also have the ability to turn undead in addition to various spells oh and of course you will have saving throws Mm-hmm. so make sure you have little sections for that and we'll give you the different numbers for those in a little bit um, you're also going to let's let's roll your money for roll three d six, and this will determine how much gold you started out with. Yourself. Three, three, one. Okay, so you have seventy gold to start out with your basic equipment. I will give you more after you get your basic equipment, but it's just a good starting point to kind of think in a yeah. limited mode, and then we'll we'll give you more as you need. To. And so we'll have to figure out how to get you that equipment at some point. Basically, if you just kind of think of what you want, we can. All right. Um, yeah. So here's setting the mood of the difference between basic and expert. So I'm going to read quite a bit from the book, but this is okay. what's really great about this. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it sets the tone that is different than other editions, importantly. By the light of your torch, you have seen the sparkle of coins and gems. You have pried magical swords from their age-old resting places. Strange beasts have been met and overcome. Odd and unexpected friendships have come to light. You are an adventurer. After each perilous dungeon expedition, you have stepped out into the sunlight to return to your home. But what do you really know of the green countryside? the farmer's golden fields and the land beyond. What of your town, friends and neighbors? Indeed, noble traveler, what do you really know of the world? Watch, the world around you is coming into focus. More details await your discovery in places far and near. Your quiet little hometown of Threshold is only a beginning. The Duke's mighty capital, Specularum, beckons from the southern coast. There you may visit the local marketplace, seeking the stories of foreign lands brought by caravans and traders. Take a raft downstream, or follow a trail into the Gnome Hills. Adventure lurks at every turn. Gather knowledge, wealth, and power. You can build a castle, attract followers, and even become ruler of a land. All this lies in your future, and this is only the beginning. The horses are ready. Dawn is breaking. Whither are we bound? Frank Menser, May. Earlier editions and rule changes. The Dungeons and Dragons game, first created in 1974, has changed as more and more people have played it. You may find three earlier versions: the original set in small brown or white boxes, mm -hmm. up in that corner there, in the wood box. The. Uh, now collectors' items in those now the in the or the blue book edition. Let's just hand them to you. Hold up. Uh, or and the red book edition. And then this the nineteen eighty two slash three edition. The original set was written by and for hobby gamers, but now, with millions of players around the world, a more generally understandable version is needed, the volume you now hold, together with a new basic set. So many changes have occurred since 1973 that the task of explaining all of them would require a booklet of this size, and thus they are not included here. Use these rules, this is the, this, this is the expert, got it right there, book is 64 pages. Use these rules along with those in the revised basic set whenever differences between the old and new rules occur. So you can use the old original D&D &D if you want to, mm -hmm. but you don't need it. You can just go straight into the basic mess. So, introduction. First there was the Dungeons & Dragons basic set. It taught you to play fantasy characters of low level experiences, low experience levels 1 to 3, and provided guidance on how to create your own dungeons for hours of fun. Now there's the D&D Expert set, which will add a whole new dimension to your games. D&D Expert will teach you how to play characters of experience levels 4 through 14. It also opens the doors to the world outside the dungeon. 
the wilderness awaits. So again, even though you guys didn't really get to do the real dungeon crawls, that's what most of the B B one through whatever dungeons are is dungeon or adventures are dungeon crawls. Now it's going to really expand your horizons. You will learn about the world your characters live and adventure in, including their hometown. And you will learn how to keep the story of your character's adventure alive in the campaign game, the saga of the world where the character lives. This set includes two booklets. The first contains all the new rules for the player and dungeon master. These rules have been carefully designed to add to those you learned in the D&D basic set and can only be used with those rules. The second is an adventure module and provides the setting for many adventures on the Isle of Dread, 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 Dread. <clears throat> as well as showing you how a wilderness is created. These new rules are easy to learn and use. If you are a player, turn to the player's information section and read about the new abilities and spells of each character class. And if you're a dungeon master, turn to the dungeon master section to review the new procedures. Now, this is the only addition, strangely, that they did in one book. All the others, basic, companion, masters, and models, they did two books. I like two books better. I think you should separate the player data mm -hmm. from the DM data. Um... You know, the One Ring role-playing games come out with second edition. It's all going to be one big book. It's unfortunate. Mm. That looked great as well. Um, Pathfinder does that, right? It's all the core rules in one. Much better to separate. But it is what it is. <clears throat> um, so when you use the D&D basic rules alone, most adventures were simple off to the dungeon, back again affairs. Your low-level characters were still learning about simple adventuring, and you were too. However, just as in real life, nothing is quite that simple. Instead of merely going from town to dungeon, your characters may now explore the hills and forests of the wilderness world, as well as the challenges of rivers and seas. So the player's opportunities. A character who grows in wealth and power may build a castle and attract followers. Settlers may come to live nearby, and your character um, sorry <laughs> um, and your character may eventually become the ruler of a land. Living in a fortress, your character may settle and control larger and larger areas, bringing civilization to the wilderness. You can discover the fun of playing the role of a medieval landowner. Coping with day-to-day -day troubles, wandering monsters, and even attacks from powerful characters, both PCs and NPCs. Your characters can continue to travel, roaming the wilderness in search of high adventure. In dungeons, many new monsters and treasures await your arrival. Castle owners may invite you in for a splendid banquet, followed by stories and rumors of great dangers and fabulous treasures. Or perhaps they will not look upon your arrival with kindness. Whichever route you choose, you will discover the excitement and intrigue in dealing with the great wide world. Things are happening elsewhere in the lands, and some events may affect your characters, such as weather, war, and politics. The characters may, in turn, affect the course of events. Many storylines may be developing at the same time, just like in a fantasy novel. Your DM will consider the greater forces of nations and rulers, and combine this flow of history with the lesser forces of the actions of your characters. Logical results may create unexpected situations, often surprising the DM. How about it? In this way, everyone contributes to the development of the fantasy world. <clears throat> so the difference between basic version and expert with the DM is, as a dungeon master, your D&D wilderness adventures will be far more challenging than a simple dungeon or two. For example, you should have a general idea of what is in each area of the wilderness, for the party may go anywhere. Although a few hints may help to guide the characters toward a desired area, you must be ready to make up minor details as needed often during so remember we talked about therapeutic wrecking control, going from high level of control, very little freedom for the player, to, you know, so very railroady, mm -hmm. kind of more training wheels, a little bit more freedom, that's kind of where we're getting to. The sandbox was, this is that whole, mm -hmm. okay, is that her connection or? Set the network. I reset it this morning. Set it up. Using hacks. Yeah. Um. Before designing a full campaign world in all its complexity, you should understand more about small towns and how they survive. 
Once you understand how towns begin and grow, cities and even whole nations can be designed. A full history and background adds that final touch to the character's world. The difference between a good campaign and a great Adventurers may even shape the history of their world as they become more powerful. More details about the lands, peoples, and cultures of a fantasy world are given in the deep set. The campaign is limited only by the creativity of the dungeon master and player. There are dragons to slay, evil hordes to overcome, towns to visit, and, as usual, dungeons to explore. Onward! Alright, so uh, they talk about hit dice and hit points. Talk about maximum levels and experience points. We're not there yet. They talk about horses. That's not really in the basic set. Mm -hmm. Talk about titles. Um, feel free to tweak them however you want. Talk about rememorizing spells. Reversed spells. So some spells may reverse. That's fairly a new thing. Mm -hmm. But cure light wounds, pause light wounds, etc. <clears throat> a cleric. So this is important for you. They reverse a spell simply by casting it backward. The player simply says, My cleric is casting the spell in reverse. However, lawful clerics prefer the normal spells and only cast the reversed forms in life or death situations. Chaotic character, but yeah, chaotic clerics often use the reverse spells and only use the normal forms to benefit their friends. Neutral clerics may choose to cast the normal or the reversed forms. The cleric must continue using the forms first chosen is not free to change from one to the other. So that's a date. Mm -hmm. Unlike cleric spells, reversible magic user and elf spells must be memorized in reverse to be used. The spellcaster must select the normal or reversed form of the spell when the spell is memorized for the day. Of course, any spell may be studied in both normal and reverse forms. For example, if a seer has a light spell in a spell book, Character can study both light and darkness in an adventure. That's pretty cool. Multiple spell effects. Yeah. Rolls, damn it. Hello. You have a question? No. Okay. Welcome back. She's been. I know. Just a slower connection. Now. Sorry. Yeah. So, is this your Wi Fi that keeps dropping? No. Oh, this is your cellular. Um, I, I honestly have no idea. I've checked my Wi-Fi. Reset, I have no idea what's going on. Did you reset your Wi-Fi router? Yeah, I did. I okay. just did. Okay. All right. Hopefully that's stable. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So player's information, character levels 4 to 14, and it jumps right into the cleric. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm going to read these aloud for your benefit, Aislinn, since you don't have a copy. For the first three levels of experience, right. a cleric's power is very limited, but as they advance to a maximum 36th level, clerics obtain more spells of greater power due both to practice and the strengthening of their beliefs. It is very important for clerics to be faithful to their beliefs. A cleric behaves in a yes. manner that does not fit the character's alignment or beliefs. A cleric may be punished by the church for even greater powers. This punishment could, for example, be a penalty on hit roll, a dangerous quest that must be completed or even a lack of spells. Your DM will tell you what the character must do to recover good standing. When a cleric reaches a main mm -hmm. level, a castle may be built. If a cleric has never been punished for misbehavior, a cleric's church may help with the cost. Some followers may come to assist and serve mm -hmm. the cleric. Your DM will help with the deal. So, what alignment do you want to be for? Between lawful, chaotic, and neutral. You need a description of those? Probably lawful. Okay, I, re I recommend that. What did you go with, Dan? Um, lawful. All right. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, let's see if they... So just because <clears throat> the concept of alignment has kind of changed between D and D versions, I'm going to reread them for your benefit. All right, thank um, you. They, they do; they are slightly different, but like A D and D, this version of D and D, and some of the other. So. <clears throat> 
Alignment, how characters and monsters behave. Take a moment now. Think about how your character behaved. This is from the solo adventure. Mm -hmm. The fighter was one of the good guys. You wanted to do the right things. For example, you brought the cleric back home with you. On the other hand, the magic user and the goblin were the bad guys. They didn't care whether you lived or died, just what they could get from you, selfish and nasty besides. There is a way to describe how your character behaves in the game. It is called alignment. Your fighter's alignment is called lawful. It tries to protect others and defeats monsters. Alina the cleric was also lawful. This is one reason why you became friends. Your charisma helped when you first met, but if your alignments were different, you probably wouldn't have been quite so friendly to each other. Fargle, the magic user, had a different alignment than yours. He was chaotic, the opposite of lawful. He was selfish, cared only about himself and steals from others. Most people don't like Chaotics. You two wouldn't normally become friends at all, except for the spell he cast that magically forced you to be his friend for a short time. That, that <laughs> happens in the adventure. Yeah. Monsters have alignments yeah. too. The goblin and the ghouls were chaotic, but the snake wasn't really bad or good, although it certainly was dangerous. <coughs> its alignment is called neutral. It will fight to protect itself and will help others, if that will help it, but it is mostly concerned with survival. Neutral doesn't mean stupid. Alignment has nothing to do with intelligence. It means a balance, an average between the law and chaos. The snake was just a typical animal trying to stay alive and get something to eat. <clears throat> uh, Lyman's to explain in more detail on page 55. All right, so I'm going to jump five. But I like that they just spell out these examples, because, again, if you've never played before, mm -hmm. or if you come from a family that hasn't raised you with a clear sense of what good and bad is, mm -hmm. it helps for the sake of the game to know what those parameters are. Yeah. So three basic ways of life guide the acts of both player characters and monsters. Each way of life is called alignment. We have law, chaos, and neutrality. Each alignment has a language. This is very specific to D&D. It's kind of a weird ism, but it is important to the game. So whatever your alignment yes. is, you have an alignment tongue that you can speak. So lawful can speak to lawful. Mm -hmm. Chaotic and neutral can't understand you separate from common tongue. Yes. Uh, each alignment has a language that includes hand signals and other body motions. Player characters always know how to speak their alignment language in addition to any others they may know. If a monster is able to speak, it will also be able to use its alignment language. Players may choose the alignments they feel will best fit their characters. A player does not have to tell other players what alignment they have picked. Lawful characters will reveal their alignment if asked. When picking alignments... Uh, so they don't have to tell the other players, but they do have to tell the DM. Uh, when picking alignments, the characters should know that the Chaotics cannot be trusted even by other Chaotics. The chaotic character does not work well with other player characters. The alignments give guidelines for characters to live by. The characters will try to follow these guidelines, but may not always be successful. If a DM feels that a player is not keeping to a character's chosen alignment, the DM may suggest a change of alignment or give the character a punishment or penalty. Law or lawful is the belief that everything should follow an order and that obeying rules is the natural way of life. This is part of why chaotic good is such a game. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's so limited. Lawful creatures will try to tell the truth, obey laws, and care about all living things. Lawful characters always try to keep their promises. They will try to obey laws as long as such laws are fair and just. If a choice must be made between the benefit of a group or an individual, a lawful character will usually choose the group. Sometimes individual freedoms must be given up for the good of the group. Lawful characters and monsters often act in predictable ways. Lawful behavior is usually the same as behavior that could be called good. And again, it's a narrow, constrained version. That's why chaotic good are more advanced options. But if you're playing with eight, nine-year-olds being introduced to this, having that narrow, prescribed approach, just, this is how you should play, works fine. And you can add the nuance later. Mm -hmm. Chaos or chaotic is the opposite of law. It is the belief that life is random and that chance and luck rule the world. Everything happens by accident and nothing can be predicted. Laws are made to be broken as long as a person can get away with it. It is not important to keep promises and lying and telling the truth are both useful. To a chaotic creature, the individual is the most important of all things. Selfishness is the normal way of life and the group is not important. Chaotics often act on sudden desires and whims. They cannot be trusted. Their behavior is hard to predict. They have strong belief in the power of luck. Chaotic behavior is usually the same as behavior that could be called evil. Neutrality or neutral is the belief that the world is a balance between law and chaos. 
It is important that neither side get too much power and upset this balance. The individual is important, but so is the group. The two sides must work together. A neutral character is most interested in personal survival. Such characters believe in their own wits and abilities rather than luck. They tend to return the treatment they receive from others. Neutral characters will join a party if they think it is in their own best interest, but will not be overly helpful unless there is some sort of profit in it. Neutral care behavior may be considered good or evil or neither, depending on the situation. So, um, example of alignment behavior. The situation. A group of player characters is attacked by a large number of monsters. Escape is not possible unless the monsters are slowed down. A lawful character will fight to protect the group, whatever the danger. The character will not run away unless the whole group does. A neutral character will fight to protect the group as long as it is reasonably safe to do so. If the danger gets too great, the character will try to save themselves, even at the expense of the party. A chaotic character might fight the monsters or might run away. The character will not care what happens to the rest of the party. Alignment languages. Each alignment has a secret language of passwords, hand signals, and other body motions. Player characters and intelligent monsters will always know their alignment languages. They will always recognize when another alignment language is being spoken, but will not understand it. Alignment languages are not written down, nor may they be learned unless a character changes alignment. When this happens, the character forgets the old alignment language and starts using the new one immediately. It's a very weird D&D. Mm -hmm. uh, note that playing in alignment does not mean a character must do stupid things. The character should always act as intelligently as the intelligence score shows, unless <laughs> there's a reason to act otherwise, such as a magical curse. Any questions on alignment? Don't change mine. What? Can I change my alignment? Nope. You already went with. You already played. She can change hers if she wants to. She hasn't played it. Yet. No. Okay. No I'm questions, and I don't want to change. Yeah. Because my character is primarily like, I need to survive. I need to survive. PTSD. I'm, I'm buried too many people. <laughs> You're gonna have to deal with that that push pull. That, okay. That is a challenge which people have to deal with. So. Okay. Deal. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> Uh, saving throws. Let's start with the cleric saving throws. So, Aislinn, here's your saving throws that you'll need to know. Death, yes. ray, death ray or poison. You have a nine. Let me know. When a nine? Write. Yes, a nine. So each time you're done writing it down, let me know and I'll read the next one. So death ray and poison is a nine? Yes. So the way the way saving All right, throws then work, I have it written down. Yeah, the way saving throws work is lower the saving throw the better because you want that number. Yeah. Lower is better. Mm -hmm. As far as the not not what you roll, but as far as the, the number written, it lowers your target number. Yes. Yeah. Uh, magic wands. You have a ten. All right. Paralysis or turn to stone. You have a twelve. Okay. Dragon breath. You have a fourteen. Oof. Rod, staff, or spell, you have a 13. <sighs> have your advantage. So you have a couple. Okay. All right. Um, spells. Okay, next is your turning undead abilities. Yes. Actually, Dan, I gotta eat. If you read uh, page four, tell her all. Of this. So she's fifth level. Mm -hmm. Let's give her all of those. Page four. And fourth level uh, cleric spells. Yes. You have uh, animate dead. Ah, oh, okay. So, uh, I'm 
trying to understand it here. Because there's D's, there's T's, and then there's numbers. Mm -hmm. Turn. Okay. So. Yeah. But I thought she was fourth level. I'm fourth level. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Um, the zombies, uh, you will immediately turn them. Um, ghoul is a T. White is... Oh, sorry. Okay, start from the beginning. Skeleton is D. Okay. Zombie is T. T as in turn. Yeah. Ghoul is T as in turn. Okay. White is seven to turn it. All right. Wraith is nine to turn it. Okay. And uh, a mummy is eleven to turn it. All right. You have no I think chance I got it. to uh, um, uh, turn either a specter or a vampire. What? You have no chance to turn uh, specters or vampires. All right. Now your saving throws. Your death ray and poison is going to be an eleven. All right. Magic That's wand. fine. Your magic ones saving throw is a twelve. Okay. Paralysis or turn to stone is 14. Okay. Dragon breath is 16. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and rod is staff and spell is 15. All right. Now, if you throw um, uh, a uh, mint into the dragon's mouth, will that give you uh, a bonus to the dragon save versus dragon breath? No. No. <laughs> I guess. Uh huh. What if I throw an entire, what if I throw an entire tin of Altoids? <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Yeah, great visual. As a Vicar, you can uh, cast Picker. I, I Picker. Used to, used to calling it Vicar. I don't know. Hmm? Reverse. Looks like it. Yeah. So at uh, at fourth level, you can cast uh, two first level spells. Okay. And you can cast one second level spell. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm gonna give you your list of first level spells. Okay. Right. Cure light wounds. And this is reversible. You can put an asterisk beside it. Okay. Detect evil. Alright. 
detect magic. Okay. Light, which is reversible. You ready? Yeah. <coughs> Protection from evil. Okay. Purify food and water. Okay. Remove fear, which is reversible. Remove what? Fear. F E A R. Fear. Okay. Yeah, I see it. Or I hear it. <laughs> and that is reversible. Okay. And uh, resist cold. All right. Next, I will be listing your second level spells. Okay. Bless, which is reversible. Okay. Find the traps. All right. Hold person, which is um reversible. What was that one? Hold person. Okay. I guess to like release somebody oh, from person. something, I guess. Maybe yeah. like a trap or something. Yeah. 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 Okay. No alignment, which is reversible. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I got that immediately wrong. I'm guessing the no alignment, uh, the reversible is a, a, an O <laughs> alignment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's called confused right. alignment to the, the reverse. Mm -hmm. Resist fire is next. Okay. Silence, 15 uh, foot radius. Okay. Snake charm. Okay. And then speak with animal. All right. And those are your first and second level spells. Thank you. You're welcome. what the adventure will be then that's the time to pick the spells that you want to start start the event okay. at this point you don't know what kind of adventure you're going on so there's no point picking which ones to memorize yet all right all right i've memorized the um uh, dig grave <laughs> dig grave <laughs> if that were a spell <laughs> oh means... no i never said it was a spell i just memorized how to dig graves <laughs> You memorize, memorize the skill. <laughs> yes. I am a dread. There you go. And here you go. You're welcome. Okay, so next. Uh, equipment. I want to help her go through the equipment list. So, updated equipment list. Might you might actually start with the basic one first, might as well since start. So in the red book player's manual section for equipment. Yeah. Um,
character class trip. Let me. Pull out. I think it was actually like. There it is. It was a pull out. Same page 29. Page 29. I have a page 29. You, but... Oh, yeah, that's the DM's guide, the player's manual. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it helps be the right book. It says oh, player's okay. manual. So that's the, mess with the pictures were exactly the same. They are exactly the same. Now you got this equipment. So why don't you keep in mind clerics have the weird demonism of they can't use weapons but draw blood, so they can use blunt weapons. Other than that, they can use any blunt weapons. So with that in mind, Aislinn, do you have a preference? Like go ahead and list the blunt weapons there, Dan. Pick from. They have asterisks by them. Spike. Ah, okay. There is the mace, the club, the sling with 30 sling stones, and the warhammer. Um, can you go over those one more time? Give her the prices, too. Yeah. There is the mace, which costs 5 gold. Okay. There is the club, which costs three gold. Okay. Unless it's got a velvet rope. Hmm? Nothing. He was, he was making like oh. a dance club joke. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that went right over my head. Sorry. <laughs> there is the sling with 30 stones. That costs two gold. Okay. And there's the Warhammer, which costs costs five gold. Okay. What? I think I'll go with the mace. The first one you said that costs five gold, correct? Yes. And you can you can choose multiples. You can have mace and sling. You can have as many as you want with you know some reason. I'll just stick with the one for now. Okay. Uh, you're going to want armor. Luckily, clerics can wear. Yes, let me read the armor yes. for you. Okay. There is the leather armor, which costs mm -hmm. 20 gold. Especially with your decks, you want the best armor you can wear. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I'm not going to be dodging anything anytime soon. Exactly. <laughs> there is chainmail armor, which costs 40. Okay. Plate mail armor, which costs 60. Okay. And you can buy a shield for 10. Okay. Let's go with the chain mail and then a shield. So together that's... 50. How, how many gold? 50 gold for the two of them. Okay. Yeah. 5 zero. Yeah. So chain mail and shield. All right. Now, in terms of uh, basic equipment, you've got a backpack for five gold. Okay. A flask of oil for two gold. All right. A holy symbol for 25 gold. Okay. A vial of holy water for 25 gold. Okay. A lantern for 10 gold. Okay. A hand-sized steel mirror for 5 gold. Okay. A 10-foot wooden pole for 1 gold. Okay. A week's worth of iron rations, which is 15 gold. All right. A week's worth, um, worth of a standard rations, which is 5 gold. 
Okay. 50 feet of rope, which is one gold. Okay. A small sack, which is one gold. Okay. A large sack is two gold. Okay. Um, uh, 12 iron spikes with a small hammer is three gold. Okay. Thieves' tools is 25 gold. Okay. A tinder box, which includes flint, steel, dry wool shavings, and twigs, that is three gold. Okay. Six torches is one gold. Okay. A water skin or wine skin, which is one gold. Okay. A quart of wine is one gold. Okay. And a bunch of wolf wolfsbane is ten gold. Okay. Uh, so I put down that I have one large sack, one week worth of rations, the pack of torches that you said was one gold, and then a water skin. Okay. Which still keeps me under my budget. Because it's nine gold altogether when I put it all together. Okay. And that was your basic equipment? Yep. Alright, so you got all your, your basics? Yes, I do. Okay, and you had, what, 70 gold? <clears throat> yes, and I think I'm left with six. <laughs> Alright, so between, that was your first level money. How much money do you, uh -huh. do you have? Me? I have, uh... Mind you, I've also spent quite a bit of money. Okay, well, how much did you have if you spent it? Uh, just in gold. Uh, I cannot tell. I have 143 gold and 75 gold. I also got... I wrote a lot of this down. I know you have thousands of copper, a hundred copper. Oh, so. I got the, uh, um, I think the one thousand two hundred and sixty-nine gold. Yeah, between just selling everything off the bodies. Right, right. Yeah, and okay. then I think it gave me six hundred thirty-four on top of that. Sure, that's not it. Pretty sure. So go ahead and give yourself a thousand gold pieces from your adventuring. So if there's additional, okay, sounds good. If you there's additional equipment you would like, <clears throat> you can spend it on that. So anything specific, you know, if like if you have a ballpark idea you want to ask, Dan can look it up see if it exists or not. Yeah, it stays pretty simple and basic. Also, do you have? Did you... No, I don't have magic. Did, did anybody in the group have plus one? Um, if there you was... You guys never made it far. The only magic I saw was uh, yeah. my magic myself. I'm going to get you guys each a basic magic level. Because by this level... Okay. Plus one shovel of the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Corp Terry. Yes, there you go. That's what you want. <laughs> of all the things you can choose. Plus one shovel, I think, would be very, very useful. Yeah, that would be the most useful for burying all your companions. Yeah, make thinking... life digging the ditches a lot easier, or for them to bury you, yeah. so they don't leave you out for the carrion crawler. All right. Um, let's go ahead and and roll a d twenty, Dan. Actually, no. Let's see. Um, roll percentile first. Holy <clears throat> random. Fifty four. Okay. Good. It's a potion. Go ahead and roll a D twenty. Eight. Okay. That's that's not bad. A uh, potion of gaseous form. Roll D four. 
Actually, you know what? Just assume two doses. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, now, um, Aislinn, go ahead and roll percentile. What does that mean? Oh. Uh, do you have a 10 sided die? Let me see. Probably, though. If not, we can divide a d20. That's an eight. Yeah, I have a ten-sided die That's right here. Very interesting that you don't know what percentile dice is. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. You'd be surprised. I play a lot of games, but I don't always play them properly. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's that's why you're here to learn lots, right? <laughs> okay. I rolled a seven. Uh, well, okay. Was it a ten-sided or a percentile? A ten-sided dice. Okay. So roll a seven again. Roll the ten sided again. Yeah, roll the ten sided again. Okay. Sorry. One. Okay, so that's a seventy one. Oh, okay. So if you roll two zeros, you. If you roll two zeros, it's a one hundred. If you roll a zero one, it's a one. Yeah. <clears throat> that's percentile. Now usually there's percentile which but ten sided is that have the tens place and then the ones place. Yeah. So they'll say like 70, 60, 50, 40, whatever, and then you have the ones. But if you don't have that, then you I, just roll one and then the other. Yeah, usually I just roll 100-sided dice, but I do not have one with me. That's fine. All right, so Curable. 71. So I do know what percentile is now okay. that you're talking about it. Okay. <laughs> uh, at least I know the terminology. Um, so you got a scroll. So roll a d20. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, 18. Uh, Reroll. 13. Reroll. <laughs> that be something that's actually 14. useful for this adventure. All right. Uh, scroll of Protection from Undead. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so you can read straight from it at once, right? Once you read from it, it's used. All right. But that's the spell that's on it, is Protection from Undead. And as far as... Well, that's just a... Let's see. Protection from... Um, protection from Undead. When read, this scroll will protect all those within a circle from a variable number of undead for six turns. The number Ooh. of undead affected varies according to their type. The skeleton, zombies, and ghouls will affect 2 to 24 of them. Whites, wraiths, or mummies, 2 to 12. Spectres are larger, 1 to 6. Okay. <clears throat> so, that could come in handy if you run into a horde. Yes. Alright, let's see. What do we have? You've got your... Now, I would definitely run by what equipment you have currently. I currently... Uh, my basic equipment or my uh, armor as well everything that you bought okay everything i have so far i have a mace i have a chainmail armor and a shield i have a large sack rations one week's worth six torches a water skin and a scroll of protection from undead which you just gave me okay um i'm going to go ahead and guide you because you didn't get to play through the basic sessions you would have okay. learned this playing the basic session you want a missile weapon, so I'd highly recommend the sling with stones. You okay, how much always, is the sling? You don't always want to get in face to face combat. So okay. And how much was that with the sling with 30 stones? The bullets? Was it two, also five? Two gold. Two. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So they have I'm pretty sure Danielle's coming. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be coming back later for a Star Trek role playing game, the new one, or just, just this game? Um I don't know if I'll have time tonight. I have some homework to do. Don't, don't do that. That's the priority. Yeah, yeah the priority you'll, for you'll sure. You'll get plenty of other chances once school's out. 
<laughs> Although I do love Star Trek, so it's very sad. Well, this is the new Star Trek role playing game, and we will do more Ooh. than one session, so you'll get another chance. To okay, see. maybe I'll tune in through YouTube and watch it. So go. while I'm doing be, homework, we're going to be learning as we go. So you, you, <laughs> I don't yeah, know how far we'll get might just be John and Dan or Dan and Danielle. We'll see. Mm hmm. Um. Okay. What else can we Got equipment. Player kill spell effects. Players and also need to worry about starting out. Okay. You're doing all your magic user stuff, Dan. Um, there's some stuff that I'm going to need. From okay, what do you need? Um, I, I only have the spells that I used from first level. Oh, okay. Well, they should all be right there in your. I think it. The matter of the DM told me what I can do. Oh, right, that's right. I actually dictate that. That's also very different. That is an important difference. All right. So, magic user. How many do you get now? Let's see, you're fourth level, so you get two and two. You've got two and two. What do you have currently as your current spells? Because there's your spell book and there's what you can memorize per day. I have read magic and magic. That's it. That's it. Oh, wow. Okay. We definitely need to. So, assuming one new spell per level in your spell book. Um, so, you would get second, third, and fourth. So, you get three new spells. Um, but you can do two. So, actually, it's going to be more than that. We'll assume two spells per, per level then. Um, so, let's see, you have, which one again, detect magic, read magic? I would have read magic and magic. Read magic, magic, magic missile. All right. We're still, we, we moved the studio down here just this past week and everyone's still in chaos. Like, where's all my dice? A fancy set there. There's... How about ventriloquism, first level? Sure. That's where you can throw your voice, make a voice like, hey, over here, buddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Make people think that a bad guy said something they didn't squabble with each other. I've, I've used that before. Gandalf yeah. used it in The Hobbit with the three trolls. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. All right, and the other one, uh, hold portal. Hold the door, 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 hold the door. Spoilers. <laughs> um, okay, so we're giving you six new ones. So that gives you four. Two, so one more first level, and then the last three will be second level. Um, um, I, no? Yeah, what? the yeah. last two. Yeah. Okay, uh, sleep. And second level spells, continual light, that's handy, which is reversible. Detect evil. Ooh, phantasmal four. So that's what's in your spell book. Else you needed for me? Okay. Well, lawful cowardice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to wear the the yellow magic user hat from uh, her, uh, uh, from Journey Quest? Uh, Perf's Perf's yellow hat. Perf's yellow hat is entirely too bold for my description. Okay. 
for my character's disposition. Okay. I was just asking if you wanted to roll. <laughs> I'm trying to be a character here. So you know what's weird? Academia EDU and ResearchGate track how many people how how many times my mm-hmm. My papers are the number one downloads of Eastern Washington. All the Eastern Washington. Mm-hmm. That's whack. All the things people could be reading, all the e-papers coming out of EWU, why is mine number one? <laughs> that's, just, that, that's just bizarre. My guess, that's been going on for months now. My guess is there's a bunch of uh, books and nerds who just really <laughs> like being like, oh my I'm god, about, there's a paper I'm on all that. about the inculcated stereotypes. But yeah, I, I, did you know that, Aislinn? That's yeah, I heard that. That's crazy. And I just like what? And, and in general, from month to month, my papers are in the top one or two percent of all papers read on researchgate.net and mm-hmm. what? Man, wow. Physics and neuroscience, all this other stuff out there. How is that even wow, fandom has some momentum. <laughs> yes, it does. But generally, yeah, that's them, for sure. To download a lot of them and stuff, you have to actually have an account, and to have an account, you have to you have to be you have to have a student, you have to have a university login. Yeah, so that's uh, that's been really tripping me out. The, the little emails I'm get. No, that can't be right. That can't be right. right. It can't be right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, let's see. We've got equipment. We've got spells. Uh, you're you're figuring out your last minute equipment or what? What are you? Um, I'm point? doing some uh, minor adjustments to uh, okay. equipment. Okay. Okay. Some more up to date equipment list there. Yeah, there is. Okay, let's see if there's anything that is out. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about adventuring here that you guys should know about. So you might okay. want some additional equipment because um, there's some new adventuring equipment. For example, do you already have a backpack? I just have a sack, which I'm probably going to trade out for a backpack. Well, no, sacks are good to, for putting loot and stuff in. All like, right. Like bag of coins and stuff. So ha- keep the sack. Mm-hmm. A backpack is only five gold. Remember, you have five. Mm-hmm. You have a thousand more gold to spend. Yeah. So a backpack <laughs> is five gold. I would highly recommend it. Okay, I shall add that right now. Good. There's a lot more, but I'm just going to focus on the highlights for you. Probably don't need a catapult. Sounds good. You probably don't need a catapult at this point. <laughs> I do. <laughs> probably not. Uh, you might want a holy symbol. Uh, if you don't have one already, it helps you to turn undead. Kind of important. <laughs> yeah, how much is that? It is 25 gold. Uh, 25 gold. 25 gold. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah. And holy water is also good it causes damage to undead monsters if you want it it is 25 gold per vial so that's pretty expensive but you've got money yeah do you have a light source torches or a lantern yes i do what do you have torches okay you know a torch lasts about one hour yes okay well i have more than one of them but good Okay. Yeah, I know they only last about an hour. Okay. Um, we've got the mirror for looking around corners, oil flasks that can be used for lanterns or to ignite weapons, 10 foot pole, sand rations, iron rations, 50 foot rope. Do you have 50 foot rope? No, I don't. I highly recommend rope. Again, these are things if you've been playing at first level, you would have acquired through adventuring. So I'm yeah. helping save you. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> Thank I would you. just let you go through trial and error, uh, which is appropriate when you're starting out. Basic level is appropriate. Uh, 50 foot rope yeah. is one gold. So we got okay. large sacks, small sacks, saddles, stakes and mallets, uh, useful for destroying vampires, thieves tools for thieves, tinderbox. Do you have a tinderbox? How are you going to light your torches? Exactly. I didn't even think about that. Exactly. Tinderbox is three gold. Okay. That is to uh, start torches, lanterns, 
campfires, etc. To use, you roll yeah. a, you roll a d6. A roll of one to two, you succeed, can be tried once per round. That's important to know. Okay. You, you know that too, right, Dan? Tinderbox? How long is the you roll a d6, mm -hmm. and on a one to two, you succeed, and can try each round. Okay. So, like, if you've got to hurry and light a fire, come on, light the fire, man! Come on, light the fire! <laughs> you got to roll each time. Yeah. Tinder Tinderbox is not guaranteed lighting, you know, like matches. Okay. So, do you have matches? <laughs> nope. 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 Okay. Again, nope. Uh, do you have a water skin? Yes, I do. Good. Good. Then there's wolves bane and garlic. If any of that interests you. Do you think I'll need it? That's up to you. That's totally up to you. I I won't say one way or the other on that. Also, I think I'll just leave it. Okay. And also, grappling hook is an option. Okay. Again, yeah, up to you if that's something you think you need. Mm, probably not. Okay. All right. Um, there's a lot of just basic info of how to do an adventure. Starting out, before journeying in the wilderness, use the following guideline to organize the party and plan the journey. One, decide where to go. Choose a goal for the adventure. Two, list the needed supplies. Prepare the party for the journey to the goal. Three, equip the party. Buy the equipment you will need as a group to reach the goal. Four, set a marching order. Arrange the characters to face combat and surprise situations. There's mapping, so you should keep track of the areas explore. Hex paper for outdoors, grid for un underground and indoors. There's becoming lost. There's the scale, etc. Um, missiles and spell ranges are read as yards in the wilderness. Well, um... Area of effect of a spell is not read as yards. That's always an important difference. Mm -hmm. So missile and spell ranges are read as yards, but area of effect of a spell is not read as yards. Very, very important. Yeah. Movement rates. Uh, typical person is uh, like 90 feet per turn in a dungeon, can travel 18 miles in a day. Ooh, that's a rigorous life. Okay. I, I've done that. That's a, that's a heck of a life. Many miles in a day? No, 18 miles in a day. Oh. It's a forced march, twenty four miles a day. That's about the most I've done. We were we were in Escalante, Southern Utah, and our guide missed our stop for the day and kept looking around the next band that we were in. So it was rugged terrain. We hiked through the night by moonlight. Finally gave up around midnight, and the next morning we got up and went around the bend, and there was our camping spot for the next day. Ooh. We did two days worth of hiking. It was supposed to be the longer part of the journey, too. Oh. He estimated we did about 22 and a half miles Ouch. in a single day through windy, treacherous canyon rivers, cutting cross rivers, fording, all of that, all in a single day. You know, I had about a 50 pound pack, and I was packing heavier than others, but I trained for it. Mm -hmm. um, I was so prepared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody else is so unprepared. I was so prepared. But, uh, yeah, hiking 22 miles in a day, and you know, not on a road. On a road, it's a lot easier, but just bushwhacking it is rough. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, okay, obstacles to movement. Okay, so some cool things that are added in here are other forms of combat techniques and such, which over time you will learn. So let's see, where did it summarize? There's actually one thing in terms of equipment that I'm going to use. Yes, what's that? Um, I'm wondering, and this, this should be fairly easy to get. I just want a tarp. <laughs> yeah, they're it, not available at this stage. Yeah, not available at this stage. You can maybe role play through something like that at, at a market. Okay. But starting out with the basic, because these are basic rules, mm -hmm. your choices are limited okay. uh, intentionally. Um, by the way, if you want to know about food options, um, you can. You can forage while traveling. It'll slow your movement rate by to two thirds normal. Um, can't do it during a forced okay. march. So foraging food includes nuts, berries, and possibly small game. You have a one in three chance of finding enough food to survive each day, depending upon the terrain and such. Could be hard or easy. Hunting. If you spend a day without moving, you know overall progress. Normal foraging is automatically successful, and you might one in four encounter some animals which may be hunted for additional food. Cool. Can't do that on a forced 
Run out of food, your characters will face mm -hmm. hunger, needing more rest, slow and travel, hit, hit roll penalties, etc. Rest. Characters or mounts must rest one full day for every six days they spend traveling. That's pretty generous. Rest may also be required that after evading generous. monsters. Yeah, if you evade a monster like you get an intense thing, then um, uh, then you've got to rest then. Those who do not rest have yeah. a minus one penalty in all your hit rolls and damage rolls until they do rest. Uh, okay. Encumbrance. Uh, let's see. Character movement rates and encumbrance. So you can handle up to 400 coins, so 40 pounds of weight, before you become enc encumbered generally. Okay. I have a four-wheeled cart and a war horse. We'll see about that. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> All right. You're pulling, so you're pulling a cart with your war horse? Yes! Oh, that's a happy war horse. <laughs> Yeah, that's what they're trying oh, yeah. for. <laughs> they must be free. <laughs> that is what every we... time he walks by, all the other horses they're all neighing and snickering at him. Like, oh, a mighty warlord, huh? Pulling a cart, are you today? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do on my first turn? I release my war horse. <laughs> what do I use the type for start for? I'm hiding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna let the war just go around and use it as a shield. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, um, so new types of special combat are added in the Expert Edition. Aerial combat. Okay. Aerial combat. Oh. Unarmed combat. Mass land combat for large scale. Naval battles. Uh -huh. Underwater combat. Ooh. And bombing with rocks and other items. Dropped from an altitude of 300 or less. So they have okay. rules for all of that, just so you know. Okay. And then they have lots and lots of information on constructing cubes. So that sounds like run, run, hide, hide, and run. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's some important things that I thought were really important. And again, this is something I think all of the role-playing games should take this into account that they don't anymore in a lot of ways. Mixing levels of characters. So this is for a system that has levels, not like GURPS doesn't. They're a point-based system, etc. During a campaign, new characters yeah. often enter the game, either replacing lost ones or brought by new players. But at the same time, more successful characters will continue to advance in experience. This creates a large difference between the levels of the different characters. This difference can cause great problems. As a guideline, if the difference in levels is five or more, the characters should probably not adventure together. This guideline will not apply at all times and should not be applied to games using retainers. So that's pretty generous though, right? A five level spread. Yeah pretty generous that's a bigger difference than pe most people think it is yeah. yeah but again it depends on the game system and that is a pretty big difference even in yeah. this game but this game doesn't have all those other things that really crank up the power level yeah. that later games do that's true so it there's a lot less point inflation in this so a ninth level fighter and a fifth and a fourth level fighter yes the ninth level fighter can definitely kick butt more than the fourth level fighter but there aren't, isn't a huge difference. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good way to just like, well, have, have the ninth level fighter be our front guy and our fourth level fighter the rear guy. And, you know, you, you still put them to good use. And even if they're first level and they're squishy yeah. in the middle, you know, mm -hmm. they're, 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 how to use a pole arm. <laughs> use missile yeah. arms. <laughs> <clears throat> just don't get too close till you leveled up enough. What do you mean? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not getting close at all. <laughs> and those first few levels go up pretty quickly compared to the, the higher level ones taking longer and longer. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, overusing dice. I think this is a wonderful statement here. A common error while dungeon mastering is the use of random dice rolls to determine everything. I see this all the time with organized play, games down at stores and conventions. They roll everything. Mm -hmm. And my number, they one, do. my number one role is unless it's critical for dramatic effect, you know, like that, that whether they succeed or fail really is, is important. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, basic tasks, they should just automatically succeed at. Mm -hmm. And I watch people rolling just to walk through the bushes or just get across the stream. Yeah. And if it's important for your story that they get washed away down the stream because they tripped and fall, okay, great. Let them have a roll. Or if it's really important for your story that they get washed away, they don't get a roll, right? They uh, The ground gives way and you're swept away and you don't have a choice if it's important for your story. 
do not roll yeah. if you need them to find something mm -hmm. and the game will die won't go anywhere until they find it yeah if you yeah. start with them as prisoners in a dungeon do not make it reliant on them succeeding on rolls to get out <laughs> <laughs> yes oh my goodness I i've made, had problems with that I, yeah i made that mistake with the convention game where Ooh. they all started in under umbar they, they, they were imprisoned and i gave them like half a dozen ways to get out through successful roles mm -hmm. but they all everybody just rolled crappily what yeah I, what i learned to do is as long as they came up with any one of those six ideas is let them succeed you know walk them through the process of level roll and then just that just determines their level of success but they will succeed one way or another whether they alert the guard or not or something is mm -hmm. do not make the advancement of the game depend on the roles yeah um and, yeah and this is how you can kill a party doing too many random roles can completely screech the main story to a halt yeah. now yeah if you, if you have a very long campaign going on that's okay I've had campaigns that lasted seven years in real time, mm -hmm. playing every week. Yeah. And it's okay to do that then, because you don't have a, we've got to be done by, it's like, just we, we just want to experience everything. Mm -hmm. And so you can do that. But if you've got a schedule you got to stick to, and you can only do one session or a few sessions, then take out most of the random encounters, unless they're specific to gathering information or advancing a story. Mm -hmm. uh, so as this guy says, yeah. uh, uh, so overusing dice rolls to determine everything. An entire evening can be spoiled if, for example, an unplanned wilderness encounter on the way to the dungeon goes badly for the party. Like, you nearly kill the party, now they all have to double back and go heal again, right? And they never get to the dungeon in the first place, and you never even get there that day. Yeah. Um, the DM must use good judgment in addition to random tables. Encounters should be scaled to the strength of the party and should be in harmony with the theme of the adventure. The DM may choose a number within the given die range rather than the roll for the amount of damage, the number appearing, etc. This may be necessary to allow for a more enjoyable game. Heavy damage early in the game may spoil some of the fun. Uh, you guys should also mm -hmm. know that uh, clerics and magic users or elf can try to invent new spells and create new magical items through research. These are difficult and lengthy projects. They have to be coordinated with the DM. Um... Permanent and unlimited uses and effects that increase with level or have no saving throw lead to massive imbalances. In most cases, you should test an idea for a time with the understanding that changes will be made if necessary. But just so you're aware, now in the expert edition, you can start creating new spells. And then it gives yeah. guidelines on how expensive it is and all of that. Chanting that. <laughs> I'm going to create the spell. Yeah, well, and then they've got like specialists and 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 such in here, like alchemists, armorers, animal trainers, engineers. These are all people you can hire per month. So, for example, an alchemist is a thousand gold. How much is I am working as the alchemist? Yeah, well, that's what you go try to make. You can go work for somebody else. Uh, seaman, spy, uh, etc. They got strongholds. Uh, then it, then they have a whole walkthrough for the DM. This is all the DM section, page twenty eight. Designing the Wilderness. Part 1, choose a setting. 2, draw maps of the area. 3, place the hometown and local dungeons. 4, locate areas under human control. 5, locate areas under non-human control. 6, describe the hometown. 7, fill in other details. 8, create layers and encounter tables. And we'll provide all of that here. And then we've got the beginning hometown of Threshold, which is a little port town. Mm -hmm. Little sections. We've got the basic... Maps of the Grand Duchy of Karamekos and the lands and environments of the D and D wilderness. By the way, we do have a whole divided entire gaze of tears of each region. So this was the first one they provided. Grand Duchy of Karamekos. Oh, no, my camera on. That's that would help. Just because I was eating, I didn't think anybody wanted to see and hear me eating. In fact, we know that because people have commented on any of us. Start with that. Grand Duchy of Karamekos. Gazetteer. So this goes into a lot more detail and has full color maps. Such. Region. But it's it's included in just the expert set. They have the maps in black and white. Have you. And when we, when we mention briefly the town of Threshold, this is the Threshold. 
comes right with the rule book. So they've got a setting included for you to go. And you can make your own. They give you all the rules to make your own. But they help you through practice. The purpose of a town is safety. The town lies, lies near dangerous wilderness. It might have a defensive wall, which stands 10 to 30 feet high, etc. But I just love that that's the opening line, mm -hmm. which is also a very one ring Adventures in the North concept, too, right? Create havens yeah. of safety and such. So, very important where you can rest. Um, okay, there was a very important couple of lines here I wanted to read to you guys about getting XP and not getting XP. Okay. So even though we're not going to run Night's Dark Terror, because it's it's too politically complicated, we do this in the short term. This has some great pointers I do want to read aloud to you. That's part of the point of this, is you get exposed to the, the, the philosophy and approach of these games compared to today's games. Um, we already talked about how before it was all dungeon crawls, now it's a little more sandboxy in, in the wilderness. This walks you through the process. Uh, you should know, because you may not know this from other games, and this is generally how I like it, uh, when, as far as healing from rest, you have to have a full, you know, night's rest. Mm -hmm. You only heal one hit point per day. Okay. Very important when strategizing long-term your recovery time. Mm -hmm. Now, being a yeah. spellcaster, although you don't, yeah, it depends if you, if you pick Cure Light Wounds, that can speed it up a lot. Yeah. And a lot of my campaigns, I also introduce herbs so that you can use a lot of uh, herb healing and such, which helps a lot. But cool. that's for more advanced. Awarding experience points. And I, I very much ascribe to this, and I think it's very important that it spells this out. You should only award experience points to characters who are in a relatively safe place. So you don't really get to process and take in all the benefit until you get to relax and feel mm -hmm. safe. Characters spending the night out in the wilderness should have to wait for their experience points until they return to their uh, hometown or someplace safe. Mm -hmm. Do not award any experience points for the killing of an NPC or monster for whom no XP value has been given. This will only encourage the PCs to slaughter anyone they meet. Yeah. So just indiscriminate killing, they get no XP. That's Which is good pretty good. <laughs> Fifth edition doesn't do yeah. that. Most of the editions don't say that. Yeah, you know, I like that rule. I, I think it's a great rule. If it's appropriate to forwarding the story, is in character, appropriate to the situation, even if it was just simply hunting for that really difficult deer and you learn from it, mm -hmm. then that's worth it if you're not indiscriminately slaughtering. But yeah. if you're just going murder hobo, this is a great way to curtail that because they don't get anything from it except risk. They get nothing but risk yeah. and they get very little benefit. They might get loot. Well, guess what? Give them very little loot. It's yeah make it look like they've already been robbed previously or something right and and these are great yeah. ways that they can start to learn that indiscriminate killing is not going to serve them well this is a fantasy setting if you're murdering quote-unquote hobos if they have anything it's no we're not talking about murdering hobos yeah we're talking about hobos who are murdering <laughs> with the murder hobos so i'm saying like if they're <laughs> but, in this, in this, in this yes crit, yes you know the quality of uh, items that you know they may come across may be unusable like, oh, yeah, yeah. They, right. they, they've got a shovel. Yeah. Sure. Have fun with the trinket system in 5th edition. I love the trinket thing in 5th edition. That's a great oh, edition. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's a fancy stick. You're not getting much for it. Here's something important to this particular version of D&D in this setting. Bargaining is quite common in the Karamekos area. And there are rules for bargaining in a pullout sheet. Okay. They actually have a Ooh. whole process to help guide through the bargaining process, which is great. Because that is more typical, right? Organized monetary systems in this time, in this kind of medieval type setting, is less less likely. We're very spoiled by our modern society and the ease of transactions, especially now with electronic. Mm -hmm. But not that long ago, and it really not that long ago, less than a hundred years ago, there was still, even though we had organized money, a lot of people still did things by barter, yeah. trade. So this has a whole process. So it says, bargaining is the most common form of trading in Karamekos. Usually the buyer and seller start by stating outrageous prices and then try to meet each other somewhere in between. So with young kids, they need help doing this. And yeah. with a lot of adults. Yeah. So I, I was a you know auto mechanic, ASC certified auto mechanic for years, and I was shocked how bad people are 
and getting good deals on cars, not understanding how much profit was worked into, especially like SUVs and trucks and such. But there's a right. lot of wiggle room that you can you can you can pressure the sales guy into giving in. Just shocked how little people bargain. And I was right. like, man, they really need to play some role playing games and have to haggle over that 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 critical ring or something that they need for their mission and really get practice in doing the haggling. This spells out how to do it. So I'm going, now these are GM notes, but I'm going to share this with you guys because it's going to be important from time to time. So for certain transactions which occur during the adventure, a base offer or price is given for the NPC concerned. Where no base offer or price is given, you should use the prices given in, you know, the normal section. Or else invent your own. If the adventurers are selling, the NPC's initial offer is one third of the base offer. Mm -hmm. So if you guys say you want 60 gold for this, they're only going to offer 20 gold, yeah. which is going to be insulting. If the NPC is selling, the initial demand is double the base price. So if you know it's worth 50 gold and they demand 100 gold, you know, anyway, the, the NPC as the GM, it, knowing it's 50 gold, say, I want 100 gold for this. 500 gold, that's outrageous! And you go back and forth. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to be careful about overdoing this. This is the tricky thing in a setting where it is mostly bargaining. You could bog down the whole day just being in, <laughs> in, in a caravan or in the in the open market and such. I mean, I have seen players who love this. Once they realize how to do it and, and get good at it, they literally spend all of the adventure in the flea market, this, this, this virtual, un, not real, <laughs> fantasy flea market, trying to get the best deals and then coming back to the party going, look at the great deals I got on this. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I mean, you know, everybody, we all know people who are like that. They go to yeah. you know, garage sales and the flea market and stuff like that. And they come back with a lot of crap. <laughs> but they got such yeah. a great deal on this crap, right? <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, you have to be careful it doesn't go too far. But it is great that they actually have, for people who don't know how to do this, give you some guidelines. So once negotiation is underway, secretly, the DM, roll 2d6 and add the PC's charisma modifier and then consult table 4. So we've got a little bargaining table here. Um, to determine what percentage of the base offer or price the NPC will eventually offer or accept. The bargaining should be role-played between the DM and players. The table only indicates how far the NPC is prepared to go. If the PCs offer a better deal, it will, of course, be accepted by the NPC. So let's do a quick little just example. Um, Aislinn, is there something you would like to get that you can think of that's really pricey, like just you would just love to just have your, your character have hit your hands on? Oh... Not off the top of my head. How about a potion of healing? Sure. In case you're a little low on spells. What is your yeah. character's charisma? My character's charisma is a 12. Okay. So, um, I as the DM will roll 2d6. I got yes. a 7. So I got a 19 total between your 12 charisma... And the seven I rolled, so that's a 19. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Um, so now cross-referencing the scale, the chart goes two, three to five. Are you tapping on something? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm done now. Okay. <laughs> you might want to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. <laughs> uh, yeah. Two, three to five, six to seven, eight to 10, 11 to 12, and 13 plus. So that's pretty good. Right now, it's generally pretty easy to... get a higher thing. So mm -hmm. there's maximum offer, minimum price. So at 13 plus, it's 140% or 60%. So um, that just kind of gives you the range from 100% being the actual price, uh, what you could get it down to. So let's say he asks for a thousand gold pieces for this potion of healing. And you know that the, the current market value of this type of potion of healing is let's say 500 gold. Them. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you come up to to this guy. He's like, oh, I've got all the greatest healing potions here. Hi, welcome. What can I do for you? 
I'd like to buy a healing potion from you, sir. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, here's one right here. It's a potion of a cure light wounds. It'll, it's a thousand gold pieces. Yes, sir. Great job here, ma'am. Sir, ma'am. What, what, is your character male, female, or, or other? Uh, uh, female, sure. Okay, all right. So, great deal here, ma'am. Now, your character <laughs> knows that that is pretty darn steep. A ripoff. <laughs> so, how do you handle that? I think your prices are a little bit steep, sir. Can I talk you down, maybe? Well, make me an offer. Hmm. I'll offer you 400 gold pieces. 400 gold? How am I supposed to feed my children with that? I've got three three little children, and they would starve if I did that. Oh, my goodness. Well, just because you're so, so friendly and a newcomer here, I'll bring it down to 750. Remember, I still got to feed my family. Hmm. Is it is it normal to be you know uh, when you when you drink oh, hello, those, who are you? Uh, hello there. Um, uh, <laughs> when when you drink those potions, are you supposed to be drinking the worm with it? No. So the worm isn't supposed to be a part of the potion. Not this one. Uh huh. And seven fifty. Excuse me. There's, uh, it seems no a bit... There's no worms in my look, potion. Look, look, look right over here. No worm there. <laughs> Would you sniff in a worm? Yes. <laughs> no. We would need to roll for that. It is a sealed vial at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I was hmm. speaking with her. You wait your turn. Okay. <laughs> so, 750, what do you say? I think you're trying to rip me off. Oh, I'll no, I offer such a you thing. 450. 450? Oh. You already said 450 before. <laughs> I said 400 oh, before. You said four, okay, brought 50. I went up 50. 50? Oh, my goodness. I, that's just. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it pains me. But I, it looks like you and your compatriot are in great need. I assume you're heroes, yes? Heroic of adventurers course. by yes. your attire. Mm -hmm. You're probably doing great deeds to help the poor and the needy and protect our town, yes? Yes. Exactly. Well, I will give you a one time only. I re I never give this to anybody, but only special heroes like you. I'll give you a special discount at 550 gold. This is my veteran adventurer hero discount. It'll barely 500. put a meal on the table for my family. What was that? Mm -mm. 500. Take it or leave it. Oh. oh. How about 500 and we take the one with the cracked glass? Okay. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> he agreed to that way too readily. Yeah, he, he really did. He What's wrong with the bottle? For the, for the coinage. Just pretend money, give him. You don't <laughs> yeah. have to subtract. Okay. Takes yeah. it, quickly gives you the vial. That's great. And he closes the, the, the <laughs> closes the, his little flap down. Uh, to, mm, it's to leaking. <laughs> it does have a little bit of little dribbles coming out of the crack. Uh -huh. I immediately pour it into <laughs> my extra white. You, know, you have an extra vial? No. Water skin. You're diluting it. No, no. Empty. Hmm. Oh, okay. Empty the water skin, put it in, I guess. Yeah. That might okay. work. All right. Anyway, there you go. So you get the idea of the process. Yeah. Now, it would have been possible if you'd started with a lower number. Because you already I probably started... should have. Yeah, because yeah. he would have gone he would have gone as low as about uh let's see, I'll have to actually do the math on this one to get the exact number. But you could you could have gotten a lower number. Right. Okay. I thought that we could only go as low as so, the basic price. I didn't know we could go lower than right. that. Right. Well it was the minimum price was sixty percent. So he would go as low as 60% because of your charisma and okay. roll. Um, so he would That's go good to know. 60% of 500 is 300. Yeah, okay. But I once... didn't know that we could go below 500. I thought that that was the minimum. Sure, I understand. But that yeah. was just... No, but I just, know that now. Yeah, that's market average. Okay. That's the beauty of haggling is <clears throat> you can get deals below market average. I do this all the time awesome. in the world. And, like, I go to pawn shops and stuff like that when I need... And I know Me what too. stuff's worth. Mm -hmm. Other people don't know. Mm -hmm. So the pawn shops are kind of the people who don't know. And the majority of the time, most people just pay what's there. Maybe they'll take five bucks off. Yeah. But I already know that, like, oh, I did my research, and this 1976 Ivan has banjo, which is a little bit of a collector's item, which I do have. Um, they were asking, like, 1800 
but I know that if they try to sell it online, they're only going to get like 500. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they've known me because I bought like 30 instruments from them. So I got it for like 400. Mm-hmm. Right. And Which they, is cool. But they paid because it was through a pawn shop, they only paid 200. Yeah. So they still made, you know, 100% above what they. Mm-hmm. So yeah. as long as they're making their profits and got a good relationship with them, you can get some screaming deals. Now, unfortunately, Pawn yeah. One has become so systematic, they've taken away a lot of that haggling from a lot of the people. So Which now, sucks. Yeah, because they, they have some pretty good quality stuff. But they have less variety mm-hmm. than they used to have. They used to take in a lot more crap. But some you know, one person's crap, another person's treasure. Yeah. Um, so now I have to go to the other less organized pawn shops. They're less reputable, don't have all the warranties and everything else. That's the problem with so systematized. But you get the idea. So but you can see how this can help train those skills that have real life benefit once you understand the mechanics because these are applicable to the real world. And it's great that they kind of spell it out. What do you think of that, Aislinn? Hello? Did we lose you? Hello, Aislinn? Oh, wait. I was muted. I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, that's normal. We, it takes a while to get used to muting and unmuting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm picking up what you're laying down about all of this bartering stuff. <laughs> okay, <good>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. All right, how are we doing? Okay, so... Let's go ahead. So that is spelled out in this B10 transition special basic expert transition module for levels two through four. Night Star Sure, one of the British special editions, really good. Um, but it's it's a much longer, more complicated, politically complicated. And again, if I had more time to prepare, it's not that it's not all, it's not any more than any other module. Mm-hmm. It's just I have very little time. So I wanted mm-hmm. to do this one because it's specifically designed for that. But really what makes more sense with evaluating the basic of system is go with what was bundled in the box. And what was bundled in the box is the Isle of Dread, which is a total classic, of course. Mm-hmm. So that is what we're going to start with. Preface. <clears throat> the harrowing ocean voyage was exhausting enough. Now you are faced with a dark island that could well be filled with cannibals. A tattered oh, no, old no. ship's lot. What's that? Nothing. Okay. A tattered... I was reacting to what you were saying. Okay. A tattered old ship's log is your only clue to the riches that may lie beyond the isle's quiet shores. Rumors of great wealth brought you here, but the thrill of adventure sustains you as you work your way inland, slashing through dense jungles and murky swamps in search of a lost plateau and the great black pearl. The Isle of Dread is a wilderness adventure designed for use with the D&D expert rules. The module includes both wilderness and dungeon encounters, complete maps, new monsters, and background for further adventures. The player characters begin their adventure by picking up on the trail left by a long-dead explorer. Rumors of great wealth and adventures lure the characters across the ocean to a tiny island known to its natives only as the Isle of Dread. 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 Once they land... The characters move inland in search, of an, in search of an ancient temple built upon a lost plateau. Hidden within the ancient temple are the secrets of the natives' ancestors, and the wealth hinted at in the old explorer's logs. I won't give away the rest of that, but you get the idea. It's meant for character levels 3 to 7. You guys are a little short-handed, but hopefully for starting out, you know, I, I can tone it down a little bit. Hopefully, now will you be able to make it for Monday's session, or are you going to be tied up with school as well? What time is Monday's session again? 7 to 10. I think I'll be able to make it. Okay, I'll good. have been home for a couple of hours and be able to make dinner by then, so I should be fine. Good. So hopefully we'll have a larger group then. Monday's usually a little better uh, attendance because Sunday's still a new schedule thing. All right. Okay. Um, so it says read the entire module carefully and become completely familiar with it. I have not had time to do that. Uh, Beck me didn't require that. You could jump straight in and play. Expert. You know, yeah. basic didn't require that expert requires more of it. I'm going to have to wing it as best I can. Um, I have time between now and tomorrow when we'll get more of the actual play done. We still have to level up everybody else next time, but a lot of the preface we've done today, mm-hmm. we won't be doing. Okay. Um, okay. The recommendations for the event. We want to make sure there's at least one magic user, elf, and at least one cleric. You guys have a magic user and you have a cleric. So you meet the minimum Perfect. requirements, even though there's only two of you. That worked out nicely. <laughs> 
There's wandering monsters. I will be kind about those. There's uh, Thank you. the continent. Center of this module is a large scale wilderness map that shows the southern portion of the continent and the northern. Okay. So up here, Terramikos kind of area. Down here is. Continent. And again, because this is training, I, I share a lot of the DM insights with you guys as part of the mm -hmm. process. Uh, I'm not going to fill out, I'm not going to go over all the continent map key stuff. I don't have to worry about that. Okay, adventure background. <clears throat> Several weeks ago, a party of adventurers was returning from a previous quest when they discovered a cache of scroll papers. The scroll papers are made of an excellent vellum parchment, a kind of paper that lasts for centuries. On the journey home, the adventurers were caught in a sudden rainstorm, and the entire cache was drenched. When the adventurers returned to Specularum, they discovered that none of the scrolls was magical. Still, magic users can always use good paper for spell research and for writing their spell books, so the adventurers carefully spread the paper in front of a fire to dry out. Much to their surprise, the adventurers found that as the paper dried, writing appeared on several of the pages. The heat had brought out secret writing on the parchment. The pages were part of a ship's log. So I'm supposed to have a tear-out copy of the ship's log, a third panelist module, an incomplete map of the Isle of Dreads also included, and you can use that map to chart the island and explore it, and then read the following box text to the players, or let them read it themselves. Okay. So here is the parchment, which is really hard to read for anybody with any kind of reading disability. Mm -hmm. Accessibility issues there, and then an incomplete. You can share that on, on there as much as possible. There, or such. And I will read aloud <clears throat> what is written for Aislinn Thank and you. everybody else's benefit as well, since we do you know, have an audience. <clears throat> when the gale finally ended, we found ourselves approximately seven days normal sailing distance due south out of Specularum. Actually, since it's got a picture of a pirate, I'm going to go with that voice. <clears throat> In the Thanagoth Archipelago, we replenished our supplies, patched up the ship, and traded our remaining goods at native villages along the shores of several islands. Some villagers were friendly, but others were hostile, and the natives attacked on sight. I suspect the hostile villagers are filled with cannibals. We skirted the coastlines of several islands, sailing south by west until we reached a small peninsula cut off by the main island by a massive stone wall. We were well received by the natives of Tanorora, a small village that guards this wall. The villagers have no name for the large island other than the Isle of Dread. Their own small peninsula is known simply as Home. The villagers told us a tale about an ancient city in the central highland on the isle that was built by the same people who built the wall. The villagers call the builders the gods. But I noticed that the names of the gods and the personal names of the clan ancestors were often the same. So I suspect that their ancestors and the builders were one and the same. I believe that the natives once possessed a much more advanced culture and that the descendants of the builders have returned to a more primitive state. The inland city is rumored to be filled with treasure beyond imagining. In particular, I heard persistent tales concerning a great black pearl of the gods that still remains in the inland city. The island waters abound with excellent pearl beds, so the rumor of the black pearl may well be true. I would have liked to explore inland to verify the rumors about the mysterious city, but too many crewmen died in the storm or by cannibal spears. Only five of us are left. I am the only professional adventurer. The others are only sailors. We can sail the small ship well enough, but on land, in hostile territory, we would be helpless. 
Once back in Specularum, I should be able to recruit a new crew and party of professional adventurers. Then I will return to claim the Great Black Pearl. One thing I managed to do before leaving, we sailed around the island and made the best map we could. We were afraid to land, since village fishermen had warned us that trying to land anywhere on the main island could be extremely dangerous, as the coasts were rocky and without beaches. As a result, the map only shows the coastal areas we could chart from the ship, but it is better than nothing. And the ship's log is signed, Rory Barbarossa. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> I think I picked the right pirate voice for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a, for sure. A well-known adventurer and sea captain who died about 30 years ago. All right, I got the voice right. Cool. Because remember, I haven't pre run right. this. I haven't run this in decades. So, uh, mm -hmm. A little research in local taverns reveals that you, uh, uh, to the characters, he had died just... Or, what? A little research local taverns reveals to the characters that just before he died, Rory was indeed recruiting for a journey south. He'd been blown off course on his last voyage. Now again, we could roleplay this. We're going to fast, again, we're trying to fast track this here just to expose you guys to the mechanics and such. Um, yeah. Uh, he had been blown off course on his last voyage and had hardly been in town a day before he started signing on new hands. Unfortunately... Uh, Rory angered a powerful wizard over a lost wager and died horribly before his journey <laughs> south began. <laughs> oh! Great! Not only does the story of Rory Barbarossa's death confirm the writing on the parchment, but every rumor that you guys can track down about the... Thanagioth? T H A N E G I O T H and uh, Gioth Archipelago tends to confirm the account. So then it says you, you should make up suitable rumors as needed to role play through that. Preparing to set sail. The characters begin the adventure in Specularum, which is in the Grand Duchy of Karamikos. The characters must acquire a ship or passage to the Isle of Dread. Uh, no parties should have. Most parties should have no trouble raising enough money to buy a small sailing ship. The characters cannot come up with the money, arrange matters so that the characters are able to get a boat or small ship that can sail the ocean. And so then they give the DM some ideas. Have a merchant hire the party to investigate the island. And they give details about that. You'll get free passage, but have to split any treasure 50-50 with their employer. Um, and can alter it in different ways. Allow the characters to buy an old, decrepit boat. Generate a percentage by dividing the price paid for the boat by the cost of a new boat. This percentage is the measure of the boat's condition. The speed and hull value of a new boat are both multiplied by this percentage, giving lower values for the party's boat. So, you know, that's another way. Allow one character to inherit a boat. Let the characters borrow the money to buy a boat, interest of at least 10% per month. So, of those options, because again, we're, we're fast-tracking here, what route would you guys would you like to take for your characters for your boat acquisition? Not acquisitions incorporated. Huh. Which which now is you know available as a fifth edition supplement. Hmm. So do you guys want to have somebody hire you to do it and you guys split the treasure fifty fifty, or do you want to try to buy an old decrepit boat with the money you have, or? Should I roll to see if you inherit a boat, which means complete luck of the draw. It could be really roll. anything. Roll. <laughs> or let you borrow money and then have interest of 10% per month. you got to talk to your party member here, not just decide unilaterally. Did you hear our uh, various options for uh, a boat? Oh, we lost. Mister. Come back to us. Come back. Come back to Mordor. Are you there? Nope. Yes. No. Hello. Hello. Oh, he's bouncing in and out again. No. Uh, Aislinn, you can always answer in the YouTube chat as well if you're bouncing in and out on Jitsi. Hello. Can you hear us? Are you stabilizing your connection, Aislinn? Hello. 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 Can you hear us? Welcome back. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. Uh, are you once again muted? Joys of tech. 
Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Back. Welcome back, Kata. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is Ginger. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm aware of the difference. <laughs> wow. Bouncing connection like crazy. Yeah. Any better? So, Aislinn, if you want, you could respond in the chat room on the YouTube channel if, if, if you can't get this connection to stabilize. At least it's text chat. If it does stabilize, we definitely prefer to have your audio. Hello, hello, hello. Are you on mute? We can't hear you. No. Oh. I think you'd like it. <laughs> all right. That's what. She, all right. So, Aislinn, uh, did you need me to reread those options to you, or did you hear the options available as far as boat acquisition? Um. So it, you can have a merchant hire you guys as a group who will then demand 50-50 of the treasure. So 50% you give to the employer, 50% you get to keep, and they'll provide what you need. Uh, or you can scrape your money together that you have and buy an old decrepit boat with the best you, know, best you can with the money. Um, or we can roll randomly to see if one of your characters inherits a boat, uh, which there's an inheritance tax, and... Um, you don't know what you'll get. You could end up with a really pitiful boat or a huge boat that you need to pay for a crew. You don't know what you will inherit. So no guarantees on that. Mm -hmm. Or you can borrow money to buy a boat, interest of 10% per month. So, Dan, what were you preferring? Um, I'd like to um, see what we can inherit. And mm -hmm. based off of that, if we, for example, if we get like, a massive ship. Mm -hmm. We could try to sell that and mm -hmm. get something smaller. Mm -hmm. If we've got a pitiful boat, we could try to sell that and try to go up. Okay. Yeah. That's your thinking. Um, so a little bit more control and less uh, really random as far as uh, trying to <laughs> strategize. Aislinn, what do you have as a preference there? So we've got a merchant hires you, will provide everything you need, but wants 50% of the treasure. Scrape together what you currently have to buy uh, some sort of old decrepit boat. Roll, roll randomly to see what you inherit. Dan has a contingency plan. If it's not, if you inherit something you don't quite want, that you sell it and try to either downgrade or upgrade as needed, and uh, or borrow money. <laughs> All right, you're gonna go with Dan's uh -huh. approach. So we're gonna randomly inherit something. Uh -huh. So make sure the boat is okay. Um, so, and that means you will have to pay a 10% inheritance tax automatically. Okay. No matter what, you'll have to pay that, and then and the ship can't, can't sell it or leave until that tax is paid first. Okay. So, if it's a very expensive boat, that could be a problem. Welcome back, Aislinn. Thank you. Yeah, I am going to agree with Dan on this. Okay. I liked his idea. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. So, not the running with scissors group. Uh, as far as no, no. Well, <laughs> considering that I, as a magic user, I'm uh, you know, I'm uh, how should I put this? Here? I'm designing my first spell. It's called Dig Ditch. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so you like, play, you like to play the game Dig Dug? <laughs> that sounded so wrong over the phone. Okay. Did not sound like what it was. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. But yeah, so Can what do we roll for this roll. inheritance thing? Yes. All right, so now I got to figure out <laughs> from expert rules, not my own ballpark, <laughs> uh, how to do that. And while I'm in the Since it suggested it, I'm assuming somewhere in the rules it lets me have different choices of boats so that then I can create a roll from it. I hope it does, because it could be quite wild otherwise. What were you going to... Um, while in the market, I'm looking for a couple of things. Which are? Um, a tarp. 
You heard nothing if not persistent. Yes. <laughs> that is good. All right, a tarp. Hey, you're looking for tarps, you be. Yes. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute because i got to focus on trying. Dasput. Okay, spells, mission levels, wilderness. Where the heck? It doesn't really tell me what section. Somewhere, it should provide Vulcan, I think. It's in this module, maybe. Well, I know that um, uh, here, yeah, in are there, some boats listed? Little, there are boats. There, oh, there's good. a riverboat sailing a canoe, oh, okay. galley, large, small, in the war, okay. lifeboat, <laughs> long ship raft. Well, it says explicitly it will not have a lifeboat with it. You might inherit a lifeboat. You will not inherit a boat with a lifeboat. Is that explicit? Uh huh. So, for this adventure. <laughs> which, which is a warning. What page is that on? That is on page 19. Water transport. There it is. All right. So, we got. I might re-roll some of these because it's not going to just straight roll could have some pretty outlandish results to inherit. I think you just lucked out right off the bat. Uh-huh. Got small sailing ship. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. Because you don't need a war galley or a large or small no. galley. Small sailing craft probably exactly what you need. Do have any details about these? I don't see water. Okay, page 43. Okay, good. 43. Again, we're sharing this as though people have never played it before. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, so that we see how accessible it is to get a game going right away. And okay, campaign, uh, uh, lifeboat, long ship, small sailing, very similar to large, but with a single mast. So it's still pretty big. 60 to 80 feet. Beam is 20, 30 feet. Draft 5 to 8. Standard crew is 10 sailors and one captain. Capacity is 100,000 coin plus crew. So that's uh, um, a lot. 10,000 pounds of carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of loot. It's pretty good. But you know, yeah. the standard crew is 10 sailors. It doesn't mean you can't get by with fewer, but you've got to have people actually know what they're doing. Yeah. So, as yeah. far as smaller ships, not counting a lifeboat, um, or a riverboat, sailing boat, coastal. See, and you need something that, because a, a sailing boat isn't really meant for coastal, it's not really meant to go across sea. I think the small sailing ship's about the smallest you can get away with, and like not die. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people with canoes, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not doing a canoe. <laughs> um, you know, raft, lifeboat for survival. Yeah, I think that's your smallest that you can get, but you're going to have to figure out how to crew it. I have an idea. All right. So yeah, I have idea? an idea too. Shall we go ahead and inherit that then? Sure. So, the yeah. value of it um, 5,000. Cool. So that's 500 gold is the 10% inheritance tax that will cost you inheriting it. Uh-huh. So who has okay. 500 gold to, to hand over to the tax man? Um, I do not have 500 gold. Yeah. Talk to your How partner. much gold do you need? 500. I think I got it, yeah. So which of you inherited it? I guess me if I'm going to be the one paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't always work that way. That's true. You in a perfect to, world. Do you want me to roll randomly, or do you want, do you want to pick? You, I'll pay. You'll, well, you can still pay, and he can still inherit. I mean, you know. Well, how much? That's do you, true. How much? How much would you have left after you, you pay? Well, let's first let's back up for a second. Do you want me to randomly roll who inherited it, or do one of you want to? Do you guys want to agree on who inherited it? Um, I'm okay with it being random. 
because I'm, I've, got yeah. a, I've got a plan. Yeah, I'm okay with it being random. <laughs> All right. Roll a d6, roll a d6. Don't, Dan, don't say yours aloud yet, but just let me see it. Okay, what'd you roll, Aislinn? A one. <laughs> okay. So Dan inherited it. Okay. He got a six. Okay. Um, but he doesn't have the money to pay the inheritance tax. No, I don't. So that's an opportunity for you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm assuming that uh, you know I you know the one of the reasons why I'm over here is that I got a letter that I inherited this vote. Great. Okay. Yeah. So then meanwhile, Aislinn, he doesn't have the money for the inheritance tax to set the boat free. It's okay. Impounded until it's paid. So you two need to talk. So, um, uh, I'm guessing uh, I inherited because uh, I had a family member who was in the shipping business die. That's how inheritance go. Yep. Um, and uh, we're in the city to take a look at this boat. I'm. I want to track down the old captain of this boat. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and my idea is, uh, um, we we have this uh, um uh, map. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to sell him uh, my inherited ship. So you do find the whole crew that was geared up for this boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you find out that the captain was recently died a horrible death after losing a wager with a wizard. Who's second in command? Ah. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> yeah. Who's second in command? <laughs> Unfortunately. He lost his mind after he witnessed the horrible death of the third character. in command. <laughs> I think we're gonna bet that there's no um, <laughs> crew left. Is that what you're getting at? No, there's eight crew members left. There's eight crew members. Oh, who's, okay. Who's the highest? <laughs> the uh, cook. The cook. The cook is the most yeah. senior, experienced crew member. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go to the cook. I'm gonna ask him how long has he has been working here as as a sailor. <laughs> About 30 years. Okay. He goes Ooh. just by the name Cookie. Cookie. Cookie, are there any worthwhile ship captains that you know of that uh, is currently without a ship? I'm good looking for good, honorable men. Ooh. Reputable men. <laughs> <laughs> what is it you want him to do? I want to give him an opportunity for a ship of his own. And possibly a crew. Someone that you'd be willing to work with. Oh, I've worked with the same captain for nigh on 30 years. That's a that's a tall order there. Did he have any second commands that he, he, he enjoyed working with, but uh, he went on to go on to his own, uh, own ship? Well, there was that little halfling feller. I didn't care much for him, but the captain seemed to take a liking to him. And come to think of it, I don't think he's got a command right now. Oh. Let's test him out. So look for it. It's Teaslin Mahaflin. I look for Teaslin Mahaflin. All right. So you look around. You find him completely in his uh, tankard, face mm -hmm. down in his tankard. Yeah, he's a little halfling, mm -hmm. so his face fits well into the tank. Yeah. So barkeep points over, you see this passed out halfway with his face. Mm -hmm. Two gray streaks in, of, of hair and so. Okay. Um, I approach him. Okay. I'm trying to figure out exactly how drunk he is. Why? Um, one, smelling how much alcohol is on him. Okay. Um, all you can smell is the alcohol because his face is in the tankard. Mm -hmm. And he seems to be snoring into his. Okay, um, I am going to. I'm going to ask the barkeep if uh, he's irregular here. I well, just the last week or so since an old friend of his apparently died a horrible death. Mm. Uh, I got to switch voices. Oi, I think so. Yes, it's, it's a friend of his died a horrible death. Does he have a place to stay? Oh, he's been staying up in one of the small rooms upstairs. I'm going to, um, uh, how much is a room? Well, for his room? No, for, for myself. A proper room. Uh, two gold piece a night. That sounds fair. I'll, I'll, I'll pay, um, one room for each of us, so four, four gold, you know, is that one, two gold pieces a night? 
What about your Patriot? Yeah. You know, two rooms. Oh, so okay. Four. Not enough for the half plane. Two of you. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I didn't know what you were Yeah. <laughs> All right. Right. No problem okay. there. And uh, um, I am going to escort the halfling to his room. Okay, so you shake him, try yeah. to get him to stand up. <laughs> oh, his, the, because of the size of his face and the tankard relative to his face, it's stuck to his face. Mm -hmm. So he sits up with the tankard like this and stuff sloshes down his chin. I'm blind! Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm blind! I can't see! Pop! <laughs> oh, and it's got a nice ring around his face. <laughs> bright red from mm -hmm. snoring into his mug. It's amazing he didn't suffocate with that little suction there mm -hmm. once he moved. And uh, looks around bloodshot eyes. He's got little streaks of gray. Mm -hmm. Looks like he's about in his 40s or so. Um, got a very, although disheveled, but very pointy little goatee. Mm -hmm. Looks around. Hey, what? What's going on? Who are you? My name oh, is Blissbane. What? My name is Blissbane. Who are you? Looks over at Aisland. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Rena. <laughs> I, I reference I that I'm the family member of uh, the captain who died. Oh. Boy. <laughs> His eyes tear up. He was a good captain. I'd seen I, I years, heard. But he was a good man. I can't lie on a surfboard. I can't. Oh. I heard he was a good man. I heard he taught you well. Would oh, you I... like to honor his memory? Uh -oh. I think it'd be better for us to speak about this tomorrow with Leveler Hex. Right. Another drink, please. Barkeep looks at you guys. No? Sleep it off. I think it'll be worth your while. Right. Well, give me a hand to get up here. Yeah, I, I give him my a hand. legs are working. The ground's kind of wobbly. I, right. I assume. You walk him to his small room. It is yeah. literally a small room. The door is half normal height. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's it looks like it was probably a closet converted <laughs> yeah. for half legs. Mm -hmm. It is not much of a space. It's got a little bed stuck in on what looks like a shelf. Mm -hmm. But it's got all the amenities. Yeah. By the way, I do ask the barkeep if I could get the room right next to that. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Mm -hmm. All right, so he goes in there and he, like just face plants into the bed and mm -hmm. he's snoring. Again. Yeah. <coughs> All right. What do you do? Uh. What? Well, how? What time of the day is it? Mid afternoon. Okay. While he's sleeping it off, I go to uh, unless you have something that you want, Aislinn. Um, <coughs> I have a. Uh, um, three things that I'm looking for in the market: okay. <laughs> a tarp, tarp, a net, a net, and information on how to get a four-wheeled wagon to ford <laughs> water. <laughs> so you're gonna take your war horse and a wagon on this ship. <clears throat> the wagon, island. yes. The war horse, maybe not. How are you gonna get? I mean, okay, if you have a port. You can get a wagon or a hoist. You can get the wagon in and out. Yeah. There's no port like that at this island that you know of. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get the wagon in and out of the boat? Okay, I'm looking at, to see if I can trade my wagon in for a life boat. <laughs> or you could just put it in storage. You can put your leave, leave your horse and boat in some sort of prepaid storage thing here. That'd be too the keep maybe could take care of them for a while while you're gone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Set some timeline that says after X time you're dead and we'll just prepay all of that. Okay, that sounds that okay. sounds fair. We're fast tracking this. Yeah. Thing. All right, so you work out a deal that if you're not back in six months, mm -hmm. the horse and wagon become his to do with as he wishes. Yeah. Um, but you'll prepay the six months. Mm -hmm. um, how much is it? How much is it? Uh, 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 hundred gold. Six months of feeding a horse, a war I horse. <laughs> that's, okay. that's pretty generous. I'm selling the war horse. <laughs> <laughs> or you could talk to your patriot here. You, you want to borrow more money from me? <laughs> I haven't borrowed any money from I, you I yet. Haven't borrowed any yet. That's true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which you don't own the boat yet until mm -hmm. you do. 
find a way. <laughs> um, uh, I want to actually. I want to trade. See if I can trade my warhorse in for a uh, um for a draft horse. All right, roll two d six. Tell me your charisma. My charisma is seven. Roll two d six. Seven. Okay, so that's pretty good. All right. Um, age is that on? Nineteen. So you're trading in your war horse for a draft horse. Yeah. <clears throat> a little bit of difference. Yeah. So you're gonna try to sell it or yeah, trade it? Uh, selling my war horse, uh, buying a draft horse. All right, you're gonna trade it for the same person That's... or two different people? Hey, John. Hey. Okay. Um, preferably, I'd like to sell the war horse to someone who um may not know war horses. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dan, can I give you some advice? Sure. Remember, the draft horses probably eat more than war horses. <laughs> so I don't know if trading it would be a better option if you're going to leave it at the port. Anyways. Hmm. Right now, I'm just you know considering selling the war horse. Okay, so okay. we're having a conversation Just, about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Meanwhile, a tarp. Mm -hmm. uh, what size tarp are you talking about? Ten foot, four foot? Oh, um, I was thinking about covering the cart. <laughs> okay, and it's yeah. a four, so what? Four feet by eight feet? Uh, call it ten That's feet. like the size of a pickup truck bed. Yeah. Uh, long bed. Yeah. Four feet by eight feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and netting it for the same size. At four foot by eight foot. Um, five gold for the tarp and ten gold for the net. For fifteen. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, call it ten, and the net doesn't have to be in good. Um, oh, we're doing the haggling yeah. thing. <laughs> <laughs> Knock off five. You and can have a lower grade tarp and a lower grade net. I'm fine that. with that. All right. So the net's got a few holes in it, and mm -hmm. the tarp isn't waterproof. Okay, not a problem. Okay, there we go. So that's ten gold. Okay. Hey, John. Hey, hey. What brings you at this hour? Go out in the car for a four o'clock meeting to get some swag. Good. All right. Excellent. We'll do that then. Voice from others show up for it as well. Danielle says she'll be here. Okay. Brooke will not. Okay. Um, so we're just getting them started on the introductory expert adventure here, mm -hmm. which will continue tomorrow. Will you be here tomorrow night for that? A uh, seven yeah. to ten slot. Okay. So because they need a little larger group, it's it's Isle of Dread instead because it's simpler. This one's way too complex politically and such. But... Oh, okay. Well, I enjoyed Isle of Dread. Do you remember it? I, do I have it memorized enough to spoil any spoilers? No. Good. Been long enough for me. So. <laughs> All right, so we're just in kind of the preamble here. Yeah. I, I, there's a whole barter mechanics <laughs> built into the... Oh. Yeah. It's good for people who don't know how to do that, teaching them how to do it. So we can play around with that. And your charisma obviously has a... Um, okay, so you got that. Uh, so what do, you and Aislin have a debate about what to do with the horse. Okay. I'm um, trying to sell the horse, the war horse. So you can go ahead and sell it? Yeah. All right. Uh, complete with the uh, um, chain barding that, it came, that I have with it and the right. saddle and barding. You're having trouble, short of selling it to the military, who obviously knows a lot about war horses, mm -hmm. you're having trouble finding anybody who even wants to touch. Then the I go horse. to the military. Okay. They're eyeballing you suspiciously about how you acquired this military <laughs> I had a friend who was in the military who wasn't as uh, lucky and as was I it was. was it standard issue to your friend yes so shouldn't you be returning it to his unit I don't know who <laughs> it was he may, he may have gotten it to, on a um, uh, tell us who your friend is and maybe we can help you return it to his unit I named the person that I got it from <laughs> 
Okay. Mm-hmm. And was this from previous adventure or you just yeah. making stuff up? Okay. So that is from back in the, that is so that's not far from here. It's part of this kingdom. Mm-hmm. So it would be returned to this military unit. Okay. They give you they offer you a ten gold piece finder. Hmm. And, not, and not really an option. Not really any option. Thank you for retrieving one of our unit's horses. Here's ten. Huh. <laughs> it is yeah. military issue. <laughs> yeah. They are Although highly I did, prized. Yeah, I did buy it though. Oh, you bought it. I well, bought. Then why didn't you say that? Oh, I'm trying to stick with story. <laughs> But you could yeah. say I bought it. Yeah, I, I bought a war horse. Lie about it. Oh, I bought a war horse <laughs> okay. with chaining and. The, okay. Yeah. Well, then why did you say you got it from a friend? Oh. He bought it from a friend. Okay, but that. But that's, yeah. Okay. Like, I'm. I'm just going on the story you told me. So logically, okay. all right, if you bought it, yeah, that I bought does it. not mean it's. Uh, that means that somebody who specializes in selling privately yeah. war horses. That's totally different than somebody who is military issue. Mm-hmm. It would be returned to the military. Okay. Yeah. So, then that, that's a completely different role play, and so instead they're interested, they're willing to give you uh, seventy five gold plus twenty five gold for the bargain. Are we haggling? Haggling? Okay. That's a hundred gold. Party number one. Take it off. Because they'll have to go through some retrain. It's not standard. Hmm. Four hundred is still in good condition. Counter with fifty. It's gonna be weeks of feeding it before it's used in the regiment. Three hundred you're getting armor. And the the bit and brittle vital. And you're just plain <laughs> <laughs> Um, as far as the barding, that's a value because it's already fitted to the horse. Yeah. Bit and bridle is really not that big a deal to them. Those are yeah, down a dozen. But we're them. talking chainmail barding. Yeah. Barting. So with, with the chainmail barding and such, they're they're willing to bring it up to 200 gold. Remember, whenever you sell stuff used, <laughs> typically at best half. Okay. Um, I point out the barding. Unless the, they have a heavy need, unless they're like yeah. desperate for I, I point out the barding mm-hmm. and says, "Okay, with a with a bit of dust, mm-hmm. this isn't used. That helps. Yeah, two twenty five final offer. I'm gonna jump in and okay. say, well, what if this is worth a lot more than that? What what if we just go to someone else? Good luck with that. As if." <laughs> <laughs> uh, they they seem to know there isn't a huge demand in this town for military grade horses other than for the military. So they are taking advantage of that. Hmm. But that's their response is, yeah, feel free. Good luck with that. Uh, how much can we get for a farm horse, though? <laughs> for what? For like a farm horse. How much would somebody pay for that? Um, depends on where you are. Just- You'd have hypothetically out, you'd have, you'd have to go out to the farmers um you know probably 40 gold 20 gold something like that hmm yeah never mind then hmm <laughs> i still think we can get more <laughs> i know we can get more because i'm losing on the on just the war horse. Yep. Not, How much not, did you pay much. for it? No, you're not really, because you're selling the used war horse still. Still. It's true. Mm-hmm. The deal. You do it? 225? Yeah. yeah. All right. Deal? With mm-hmm. armor and okay. All right. Yeah. Do 25 gold you get. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, Aislin. It's she's got her name. Hmm. Uh, John signing you into the roster here. We have a roster that to sign in every time to track your hours. So ah, from, okay. From one to ninety nine hours, you're a red shirt. <laughs> 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 we do 
That's not I good. Know, I don't know if you can see the rainbow up on the, on the green screen. Um, but, yeah, I don't think it's in the camera. Yeah, it's not in the camera. But anyway, uh, we we do a Roy G. Biv. Uh, just to show seniority is ours. It's not really any command structure. It's just showing how long people have been doing it. And mm -hmm. 099 is, is red. Uh, uh, 100 to think 200, 250 is orange. Next increment, I think up to 500 is yellow. It does the whole rainbow, Roy G. Biv, which is also a reference yeah. to the paranoia role playing game. And then the red mm -hmm. shirt is, of course, a Star Trek reference. So we got all yes. of that into one into one little uh, volunteer seniority tracking thing. So we track your hours. It also is part of you know your training and diploma and all of that. The certain minimum hours of engagement. What number? Mm -hmm. uh, what's your volunteer ID number? Remember? No, okay, you. Can, it was like sixty four. I, I can look it up. It's on yeah. our website on our staff list. If you log in on our mm -hmm. main website, not the not the RPGSN, but our www.rpgresearch.com, under staff yeah. staff contact list, you should be able to see, see when you're logged in. Not visible yeah. to the public. You have to be logged in. That lists everybody's uh, volunteer ID number. So yours is number sixty three. David Perlman is sixty four, who just joined us. 63 okay 63 i knew it was somewhere around there sure yeah okay and dan you're a uh, yellow or green i think Hours. i may be you're at least yellow i'm at least yellow least think about the color what i think i'm green uh seven and daniel Perlman just got here 1500 uh no um what David Pullman. No, 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 no. He's 64. He's not here. I was just giving him. Oh. I was just telling her she was 63. He's well, 64. Uh, Danielle just remoted in, though. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> for the meeting. All right. Um, ah. Aislinn, it's up to you if you want to stick around for this meeting or not. This is the end of the uh, applied gaming section. We now have an administrative meeting about trying to come up with ideas for swag for RPG research for for. You know, buttons, hats, whatever, for people who want such things from RPG Research. So you are welcome to participate in that, or you can check out because of school stuff. It's up to you. Uh, I can. I might stay for another couple of minutes, but I I got to pop off soon. Understood. Okay. So we will continue this adventure. We kind of got everything in place. You guys. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, let me quickly ask you guys. Well, we'll we'll continue the role play. If <laughs> yeah. you'll be here tomorrow night. Yeah. Uh, seven to ten. Yeah. Uh, you mm -hmm. and Dan and whoever the additional adventurers are that join you can work out the details of the inheritance tax and the crewmen of the ship. But you guys at least have already taken yes. care of getting the ship. Mm -hmm. So whoever yes. joins us tomorrow, you'll just you know you guys will already know each other from wherever because right. yeah. we want to yeah. fast track doing the actual playthrough for the mechanics purpose. So this session yeah. we already covered a lot of what is introduced in the expert system. From the basic system, mm -hmm. so you might want to watch the video, listen to it, whatever. Okay. So you catch up on it. All right. Um, I'm going to stop the stream and then start the stream for the separate meeting. Yeah. You just hang tight here, Aislin. That nothing changes on your end. Mm -hmm. It's on the YouTube end that okay. stops. And I have All right. some errands that I got to do. Okay. For All right.